This is Bazaar Morning Call. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. Good morning. You're with us here on a fresh new edition of Bazaar Morning Call. We are coming to you live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios. Uh, and of course, we are coming out of uh, yesterday, Wednesday, which of course was absolute carnage, absolute bloodbath as far as broader markets are concerned. So where does all of it leave us? That's the question. That's the debating point, uh, which we will uh, talk about here over the next uh, two, two and a half hours. Guys, hi, morning. Hi, Prashant. Good morning, uh, Nigel. Morning. Well, you know, yesterday was one of those days when you just was wait. You just were waiting for the day to end. But that's yeah. the kind of carnage that you saw, right? And I'm sure a lot of individual portfolios must have been under a lot of pressure yesterday. But the only thing to remember is that this is a market that has rallied for one and a half years non-stop. So at some point in time, I mean, nothing goes up in a linear fashion. So at some point in time, some give back has to happen. Well, that's right. So now, you know, the, everyone was only waiting for the final bell yesterday. The stop yeah. loss was 330. You know, and that's, that's the only one that, you know, people are looking at. But I'll tell you what. In the next few days, you're going to get a chance to buy some very good quality mid-cap names. And if you are asking for that dip, you've got it. Hopefully, you don't get a larger one. <laughs> but, uh, you know, s select mid-cap stocks that have fallen. I'm not talking about the small-cap names. The mid-cap names, some of them, they're going to be approaching those attractive levels. Absolutely. And I think uh, that's what one should stay focused on, which is the slightly longer term. And uh, try and it's very, very difficult to do because psychologically, the impact is very large. And portfolios are, of course, also feeling the heat. But you've got to keep the goalpost a little further away. Now, let's just quickly tell you, uh, you know, where we are, right? And I think let's just start by taking stock. This is uh, the three indices, the Nifty, the Mid-Cap Index, and the Small Cap Index from the highs that we saw. And, uh, you know, on your screen. And, you know, same time yesterday morning or day before uh, morning, you had a situation where the Nifty had lost 10%. The small, the Nifty, sorry, the Small Cap Index had lost 10% from the high. And the Nifty was actually just half a percent away. So basically at all-time highs. Nifty Bank is, it doesn't make sense to look at it because it never went back to its previous high in this entire cycle. But yesterday, the Nifty also caught up. So Nifty is now, uh, after yesterday, down about 2% from the highs. And of course, the big one is the small cap index in terms of the correction. Uh, now, <clears throat> yesterday uh, we, uh, was the sort of first, not yesterday actually, this particular phase is the first proper correction in small cap since this rally began. Uh, and the, when did the rally begin? It began in March of 2023. If you remember, 31st of March 2023 was the absolute low. And then the market started going up nonstop, right? And uh, we've had pullbacks, but they've lasted one day, one and a half days at best. Uh, they've been in the magnitude of 2%, 3%, 4%. 4%. We remember that. And then the market st starts to continue to rally back up. Uh, the question, and we'll get to that in just a bit, is it going to be something similar or maybe a little more prolonged? Now, carnage uh, in the broader market is what we saw yesterday. Market breadth was extremely negative. Declines, outnumber advances, 14 is to 1. So very, very hard to actually find. Forget about big gainers, any gainers uh, in a market like what we had yesterday. Now, I just want to say something at the outside. You know, fundamentally, nothing has changed. I mean, you're talking about, uh, you know, you want to talk about earnings, you want to talk about the quality of companies, you talk about pro growth prospects, growth in India at a, at a broader macro-ish kind of level. All of that remains absolutely intact. So I think that is an important thing to remember. What is happening is some of the excess and froth in the system is getting cleaned out. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've been making this point for the last many days. And, you know, if you remember, many are talking about uh, the SEBI chief's recent comments on camera. But the first time, uh, you know, sort so of she highlighted that there is some froth building up in the broader market was in that letter to Amphi. This is about uh, almost a month ago. And we said, well, pay attention to it. Uh, because, I mean, it's extremely unusual for the regulator to voice concerns like this. They're doing it, you, you know, better pay uh, sort of attention. And that largely was the top of the market. So important to remember, this is some excess and froth in the system getting cleaned out. Uh, the old market adage, prices move and reasons follow. And we all know so many, I mean, uh, reasons which are being given about why the market is down. And I'm not going to go into all the detail, all the details because it's well discussed now. But one important technical reason, apart from everything else, which is the fact that, I mean, regulators saying uh, you know, there is a bit, maybe a little bit of froth and wants to, uh, you know, they want to cool things out. There is the RBI action, which is being discussed. I mean, forget all of that. Uh, and, of course, the fact that valuations, etc., in certain pockets had absolutely uh, gone to absurd levels. There is also the March tax harvesting, uh, March is a tax, tax harvesting month. So it's an important factor, and that will only come to a close by uh, the end of this month. So there is some time to go there. Uh, expect 
pullbacks along the way, when I say pullbacks, some r rallies along the way as well. It's not going to go one way. But I would say that things could take a few more days to actually settle down. The mood in the market for the last one and a half years actually has been to buy every dip and you make money. Uh, that may well still be the case, but is, the question is how much is the dip? It's, it's not This one is not a 3-4% kind of a two-day, three-day kind of a sell-off that, that we've had in the past one and a half years. It could maybe it'll be a little more prolonged. Uh, so one ha one will have to be patient. We are, technically speaking, already getting into the oversold zone, right? The Nifty, simple, Nifty RSI is at 46. Small cap RSI is of yesterday. Daily RSI yesterday is at 24. Uh, uh, you know, but again, small cap is a very varied uh, space. Better to look at RSI on the Nifty. And perhaps there is some more pressure because on the Nifty, we've just uh, about started to come off a little bit. I would say look for, start to make a list of attractively priced, good quality, mid and small caps to invest for the long term. You don't have to do it today, but I think it'll, uh, you know, some of these things will happen pretty quickly, but you've got to be ready. Not just with, of course, the cash, uh, but of course also with what you want to do and have, you'll have to be decisive over the next uh, few trading sessions. Uh, just a quick word, uh, and I'll just wrap this up quickly. Overnight equities were very, very, uh, were a little soft. S&P was down uh, a little bit. NASDAQ was down half a percent. Uh, the 10-year went up to about 4.2%. Oil's up about 3%. So that's a meaningful rally. And copper, copper prices, which we'll discuss more, that spiked to 11-month high. Uh, supports on the nifties, the 40-day exponential moving average. Watch on the downside. That is about 21,959. Below that, you know, further downsides open up. And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, the support is the, there's an ending diagonal pattern, which we can talk about later. They, that got broken yesterday. It's not a great thing. It's not a, actually. It's a. It's a pretty a poor technical signal for what is to follow. It's only once happened before, back in 2007, eight. That now becomes a resistance, which is 22,135. We left off just under 22,000. So that's about 100, 150 odd points away from where we left off. Gift Nifty will come up on your screen. It's indicating a flattish 30 odd point lower start. Sonia. Oh, absolutely. And you know, one must not forget, right, uh, that this rally has also been relentless yeah. in the last five months. If you just pull up the Nifty chart, you'll see from the lows of 18,500 in the month of October. We are sitting at 22,500 as of last week, which is a 4,000 point nifty rally that we've seen in five months. So some give back, some, uh, you know, taking off of positions had to happen at some point in time. It was just a matter of time. I mean, you look at that relentless move, right? Having said that, yesterday there was large selling that came in from FII, so foreign investors. Uh, almost $2 billion of FII selling. So if you adjust for the ITC block, then FIs have sold 15,600 crores in the cash markets in one trading day. And this is despite large caps not falling as much. So there could perhaps be more trimming of positions in the days to come. Don't rule that out. The focus should now be squarely on large caps and on good quality mid cap names. That's the only way to approach this market when it is falling so relentlessly. A couple of things to watch out for. Some of them Prashant has already mentioned. There's the advanced tax payment on the 15th of March. Uh, there is, of course, squaring off of positions that happens end of year as well. And sometimes when that happens, you know, the market sell-off continues. So that could be one of the reasons. There is the MF stress test that will happen on the 15th. There's the FTSE rebalancing that happens on the 15th as well. And that could lead to some flows coming into HDFC Bank. And if you map the trajectory of HDFC Bank in the last couple of days, you'll notice that there is delivery-based buying that you are seeing in large cap names like HDFC Bank. Another important internal to look at is the PCR, the put call ratio, which has fallen to 0.65, an indication that the market positioning at this point in time is a bit on the lighter side. It's not very heavy, an indication that perhaps we are not in for such a bad run from here on. So this is some of the what the technicals are uh, suggesting. But for now, don't uh, you know rule out the fact that there could be some more correction. The best way to approach it is to A, have patience and B, look at some of the large cap and quality mid cap names. What are you tracking? Well, if I have to look at the mid cap and the small cap indices, uh, one out of the bigger factors, that's the advanced tax, that should be done by today or tomorrow. You know, yesterday that could have been partly one of the reasons why we did see selling, but that should be out by tomorrow itself since tomorrow is the due date. Well, the biggest problem yesterday was the advanced decline ratio, and that should come up for you on the screen. You had 22 stocks that were declining for just one stock that was advancing, which was a bit of an issue. What do the FIs do? Well, they added short positions. They added closer on 11,000 short positions. And I'll tell you what I normally like when the FIs add some short positions. It gives you a bit of a cushion. If things go wrong, they'll have to you know, cover up their short position. But a market that's devoid of short positions is actually a problem. Because then you, you are only relying on the cash market flows. And as we mentioned, that the FIs, they turn net sellers to a larger extent, X of the IDC block. 
and the short positions have now gone up to around 44,000 contracts odd. Not too aggressive, but shorts in the system is not a bad thing. That's the short point I'm making. The 50 DMA of two big parameters is what I'm looking at. The Nifty and, the, and uh, Reliance Industries. So yesterday, both those two, you know, they came closer to around the 50 DMA and they bounced off that mark. So as a reference point, I don't want either of these two to go ahead and break the 50 DMA. That becomes a bit of a reference point. So that's point number one. You track this data point very, very closely. The other one is the PCR. The PCR has come down to 0.65. Why is that? Because the call writing has become very aggressive. We saw aggressive call writing and we normally point this out, right? The PCR, when it goes to around 0.65 to around 0 0.7, 0 0.63 approximately, that's a technical factor that plays out, and that's the reason why you could see a bit of a bounce. And just take a look at the call writing yesterday. You had close to around 2 crore shares that were added out there, and the premium crashed big time, 90% down on some of those strikes as well. So the bears are feeling very, very confident. Because of that technical indicator, at some point of time, I think from the day's low, we could see a bit of a bounce. It, uh, you know, we'll have to see the durability of that, but from the day's low, I think we'll get a bit of a bounce. The PCR has hit that lower end of the range. Support zone, 21,500 or 21,800, already mentioned the 50 DMA for you. And on the upside, the 20 DMA, which was the support when we were falling, that becomes a bit of a resistance zone as well. The Nifty Bank, that ended pat in line yesterday with around the 20 DMA. So that's the crucial range I'm looking at. You don't want it to break that. But give and take everything, if Reliance Industries and the Nifty can defend the 50 DMA, and because the PCR has come down to around 0.65 odd, on the headline index, which is the Nifty, I think we could get a bit of an intraday bounce today. There's a weekly expiry that does play out as well. Hey, thanks a lot. You know, this reminds me, the fall that we saw yesterday reminds me of some... I mean, now people will start pulling out Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch quotes as well to make themselves feel better, right? One of them, right? Far more money has been lost by investors trying to anticipate corrections than lost in the corrections itself. So, I guess this is a market for the patient and, uh, well, patience is the only it's thing that can take you. It's also a market, Yesterday was somebody who was telling me that in small caps, there are Buffett quotes. And in micro caps, there are Sadhguru quotes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only way to get you through this, right? Well, hopefully it was just a one-day blow. Let's see how things go from here. But uh, interesting times for our markets. On the equities front, we have uh, some views coming in from Venugopal Gare of Bernstein, who says that last week they highlighted that of the mid-cap 150 stocks, over half traded at a PE of over 40 times and a quarter above 60 times. Additionally, he adds several stocks were seeing downward revisions compared to upward revisions and the gap with the Nifty has expanded to the highest level in the past decade, he says. The reality is that we are in a bubble, but a sound macro was stopping massive corrections. He believes the small corrections we have seen this week and in 2024 so far do not alter the valuation equation. They are still rich. Vinugopal says it is tough to generate positive returns this year and brace for volatility. He says large caps remain a better way to express macro excitement. Okay, well, it gives you money market views uh, as well. This is Parul Mutal Sena of Standard Chartered Bank who says that the USD INR moved back higher in the 82.85 to 82.9 to a dollar range driven by FBI outflows and a rise in the US rates. She says US INR, uh, USD INR volatility remains low as we continue to see inflows being absorbed by local banks. She remains positive on the USD INR in the near term, driven by fundamentals and positive seasonality on trade deficit. She expects the pair to trade between 82.65 to 83 to a dollar in the coming week. All right, and on the bonds, Dhawal Dalal of Edelweiss says Indian bond prices have been range-bound with a declining bias recently as investors pass through global inflation data and book some gains. He says he continues to remain bullish. He expects inflation to trend lower at a slower pace, which should allow central banks to proceed with rate cuts. He expects the 10-year benchmark bond yield to trend towards 7% in the near term. Well, there's a lot of stock specific action to track for you. We'll get to that in just a bit in our special top 10 segment. But for the time being, let's run you through the list. We're looking at Tata Motors, Sona BLW, Precision, Uno Minda, Yes Bank, IFL Finance, Scient, KEC International and DLF. All of them will be reacting to positive news flow. While we have Federal Bank and South Indian Bank that will be reacting to negative news flow. <clears throat> okay, all right. Well, uh, we have uh, Cameron Brand, who is uh, Director of Research at EPFR Global, who is joining in. Cameron, great to have you with us here on the program. Thanks very much. We're not too concerned about global markets because, I mean, what we're seeing, what we have here in India is a bit local. Uh, you know, the Indian small cap product, if I can call it a product, uh, was by far the best performing asset class in the world for the last year, year and a half or so. You know, some were joking and saying it's, uh, it's like a half a percent daily compounding product, uh, maybe more. But... Uh, uh, that's kind of come uh, to a halt, maybe a pause. Uh, we're about 13-14% off the highs, but uh, 
Uh, give us some perspective in terms of what flows into India dedicated funds, etc. look like. What's the perception like? Uh, because there is also the big event, which is the general elections uh, in front of us here. Go on. Um, so uh, the 30,000 foot view, I think, uh, is pause. Um, that's certainly what we're seeing here. Um, but India remains uh, slightly exempt from a fund flow perspective from that. Uh, dedicated India equity funds are on track for another very solid week with a day to go. Uh, they're moving in on a, a $600 million inflow, uh, which is by far and away the biggest uh, inflow for a, a dedicated country group. So, um, you know, the broad background certainly suggests pause and, uh, and you know, I'm not at all surprised <laughs> that you're seeing some uh, some form of correction. Um, but uh, you know, the narrative around India uh, remains extremely positive. Uh, we're closing in on, on a year of continuous uh, above in average weekly inflows to dedicated India funds. Uh, the average allocation among the GEM funds we track, though unfortunately they aren't getting very much money, uh, is at a record high for India. So. Certainly from a fund flow perspective, though, uh, the overall tone is definitely uh, a little more cautious than it was coming into this year. India remains in a very good place. Okay, India remains in a very good place. I think that was the, you know, the calming words that our market needed at this point in time, given the kind of sell-off we had yesterday. Yesterday was truly a day when people were sort of rethinking, you know, their uh, investments in the market. But, I mean, it was just one day. So, what do you do at a time like this? Do you continue to stay focused on investing your money in India? And where are you seeing uh, the money go in? Because yesterday we did see large FII outflows from the Indian markets. Right. Uh, I, I mean, when there is uh, some volatility, some uncertainty, there's an obvious tendency to head towards uh, the big liquid names. So, you know, I would expect when I start to drill deeper into the numbers that I'll see something of a rotation uh, to large cap uh, funds uh, over this period. Um, but certainly the narrative, you mentioned India's election. Um, there's very little uncertainty, perhaps too little uncertainty. Uh, about how that will play out and, and the fairly benign effect it will have on the current policy landscape for India. All right. Hi, Cameron. Good morning. Good to see you, Ben. Cameron, I wanted to ask you about uh, flows to China. You know, in the last one month or so, it, that market has been outperforming. It's a bombed out market, mind you. In the last one year or so, we are thumping the table that India is doing much better. But in the last one month, they seem to be getting some, some, some part of their game back, so to call it. Are they getting flows? Uh, yes, uh, they've been getting certainly a dedicated China funds. Been getting very strong domestic support for some time. Uh, we are seeing a little bit more interest uh, externally, um, but that is somewhat offset by uh, investors taking the chance to exit at a slightly higher price point. Uh, so we are seeing uh, a modest uptick in flows, but uh, it's pretty weak and, and, and enthusiasm for perhaps a revival in China's uh, economic picture is being offset by people using that to uh, cut their exposure. All right. Okay, Cameron, thanks a lot. We have you on a bit of a scratchy line, so we'll try and uh, you know touch base with you again later. But thank you for your time here on CNBC TV 18. Let's slip into a quick break. On the other side, our list of top 10 stocks is lined up. Stay tuned. Welcome back. After that big fall yesterday, all eyes will be on what happens today. The implied opening from the Nifty is suggesting a 25-point cut, but the bigger problem really is in the broader markets, as we all know. That will be a place to watch. But let's talk about individual stocks now. Abhishek is joining in first up to tell us about Federal Bank and South Indian Bank and why you should keep that on your radar. Abhishek, good morning. 
Good morning, Sonia. So RBI has, uh, you know, halted uh, the fresh issue of co-branded credit cards for both Federal Bank as well as South Indian Bank. Now, the issue appears to be specific with respect to, uh, you know, their co-branded uh, partnership that they have. Federal Bank has partnership with One Card and Scapia, while, uh, you know, South Indian Bank has partnership with One Card amongst the fintech, along with the fact that they also have a partnership with SBI cards. So it looks like RBI is, uh, you know, coming down on fintech's partnership uh, with respect to uh, credit cards that they have with banks. As per one card uh, website, uh, they have partnership with Indian Bank, CSB Bank, SBM, as well as Bank of Baroda. So keep them also on radar. Outstanding credit card exposure for Federal Bank is about 1.4% of the loans and about 1.8% of South Indian Bank loans. So the fee income can get impacted. And this, uh, uh, you know, RBI halt can also weigh in on the stock price and trade today. Back to you. Okay, thanks a lot for that. Well, another stock that we're looking at this morning is Tata Motors. I'm going with green on that stock uh, because the company has signed an MOU with the Tamil Nadu government to set up a vehicle manufacturing facility in the state. Uh, now, this MOU uh, envisages an investment of 9,000 crores over five years by Tata Motors. Um, it, this will be for several reasons. It will also be for electric vehicles. And, you know, if you look at the uh, electric vehicle trajectory for Tata Motors, it currently has about 73.2% market share in the passenger electric vehicle space as per Vahan registration data recently. There's been very strong growth in the EV space as well. In the last quarter, they saw a 21% volume growth in the EV space year on year. Tata Motors has big plans in elect electrification. Uh, they plan to introduce five new variants by 2025. The total investment that they're looking at in the overall business in India is about 8,000 crores in FY24. So far in the passenger vehicle and the EV business, they have already invested 1,470 crores. And now they've signed an MOU with the Tamil Nadu government to set up a vehicle manufacturing facility in Tamil Nadu. So that is, you know, they're moving forward with that plan. Going with green over there. Uh, the other stocks, of course, this will also mean positives for uh, auto ancillary makers, whether it's Sona, BLW, Uno, Minda, etc. In fact, there is a new scheme uh, called the Electric Mobility Promotion Scheme 2024. This is in order to support electric two-wheelers, three-wheelers and e-rickshaws. Uh, this is a CNBC TV80 news break as well. The government has announced 500 crores for a special four-month scheme till July of 2024. However, the incentives for two-wheelers has been reduced to 10,000 rupees from 22,500 earlier. The incentives for electric three-wheelers has been fixed at 25,000 for e-rickshaws. And there is a 50,000 rupee incentive for electric three-wheelers with higher battery capacity. So positive data coming through for a lot of these players in the EV ecosystem. Okay, all right. Uh, Sonia, so we'll be keeping an eye out on all of those names that Sonia just mentioned. But uh, let's go across uh, to Abhishek, who's back with us, to tell us about Yes Bank as well as IFL Finance. Abhishek? Uh, well, Nigel, to begin with, Yes Bank, as per Mint report, they are looking for a new promoter. So they are looking to uh, pare down or, you know, uh, sell down 51% of the stake in the bank. Now, they have hired uh, Citigroup India with respect to finding a buyer. And this is with respect to the stake uh, that is being held by SBI, LSE, etc., who had come in in 2020 and they are looking for an exit. So this might be an exit uh, opportunity for them and find a new promoter for Yes Bank uh, uh, itself. So bank is seeking a valuation of uh, you know 20 25 percent higher uh, than what it is trading right now at IFL Finance, the company is looking to raise about 1,500 crore via right issue and another 500 crore via NCD. So fundraising spree continues for IFL Finance after the diktat uh, from RBI that they have had on the gold loan portfolio. Uh, they have made a few appointments as well, Mr. Kurian, Mr. Niranjan, Mr. Bhattacharji and uh, Mr. Pillai as well as Ms. Molly Agarwal which are up on screen for reference. Back to you. All right, uh, <clears throat> Abhishek, uh, thanks very much uh, for that. Most talks with news flow, Vamakshi is here with that list. Vamakshi, good morning. Well, good morning, Prashant. Let me first start off with Scient. Uh, the stock is expected to open in the green after the company has signed a multi-year services agreement with Airbus for cabin and cargo engineering. The company was selected for the development of a part of its cabin intelligent core management platform. Apart from that, also watch out for KEC. Uh, the company has won new orders worth almost 2,257 crores across various businesses. In fact, the oil and gas pipeline business has secured its first ever international order for a pipeline laying 
new project. And with these orders, the year-to-date order inflow now stands at 16,000 crores, uh, taking the company closer to its uh, order inflow guidance of almost 20,000 crores for FY24. So on the back of this development, expect the stock to open in the green. And lastly, let's also focus in on DLF. Uh, the company's wholly owned subsidiary, that is DLF IT offices, has sold a nearly five-acre land parcel in Chennai to Chola Mandalam Investments for 735 crores. Okay, all right, Bamakshi, thanks a lot uh, for that. Well, let's do a quick revision of all the stocks that we just covered for you. Stocks with positive news flow, Tata Motors, Sona, BLW Precision, Uno Minda, Yes Bank, IFL Finance, Scient, KEC International and DLF, while stocks with negative news flow include Federal Bank and South Indian Bank. Well, those are all the top 10 stocks that you should be tracking, but Sudarshan has done a lot of reading this morning and he's joining us to fill us in with all the top brokerage notes that he's tracking. Sudarshan, morning. Morning, Nigel. So first, I have Jeffries on Chola Mandalam Investment. It has a buy call and target is 1400 per share. It says company should deliver healthy growth despite softer CV loan growth outlook, repricing of auto loans to offset higher cost of funds and support net interest margin. It expects return on assets to rise 20 bips in FY24-26 and EPS should rise at 30% CAGR in FY24-26. It finds valuations reasonable after recent pullback. HSBC on IFL Finance, it has downgraded the stock to reduce and target is cut to rupees 340 from rupees 790 per share. It says gold loan business has been disrupted for now and it will impact overall AUM growth, revenue and profitability. Other IFL business may be forced to moderate growth. It has cut FY25-26 EPS estimates to 21 to 38 percent. Lastly, HSBC on oil marketing companies, it reiterates buy on BPCL, HPCL and IOC. It says day adjusted oil product demand grew despite fears of price, cu price cuts in the market. Marketing and refining margins are robust given range bound oil price and margin is robust on unchanged pump price, but pet cam segments remains weak. All right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so thanks very much for that. We'll have uh, we'll come back to you for more. Uh, but those are some of the top brokerage reports and uh, notes on stocks which are coming. Uh, Manisha is now joining in with a roundup of what's happening in the commodity space. And uh, Manisha, the big rally in copper, noteworthy. Oh, well, absolutely. It's trading at a seven-month highs on uh, Elumi, and we have seen very strong gains. I mean, 3.5% of a jump-up is what we've seen in this week itself come in for copper, and the markets are looking at lower inventories in case of Elumi. It also has to do with the TCRCs, where 15 China smelters have now agreed to join production cuts due to losses there, and the markets do believe that for the near term, you could see further run-up coming in for the copper, and the other metal prices seem to be taking cues from that, where we are trading quite in the positive. But it's not just metals. Take a look at the crude oil prices and a 3% gain in crude overnight has taken the prices to a four-month high here as well. The U.S. crude inventories decline, decline in gasoline stocks, supply disruptions after Ukraine attacks, Russian refineries are some of the supportive factors here as well. Actually, everything, precious metals also trading in the positive. So we have started Asia on a very strong note when it comes to energy and metals for the space. All right. Thanks a lot, Manisha, for that. Well, uh, let's move on. Sources have told CNBC TV18 that the government has directed public sector banks to do a comprehensive review of their gold loan portfolios. Sapna Das joins in to give us all the details. Sapna, what is the government saying? Well, uh, what we understand is that as the relations uh, sent out uh, by the finance ministry, basically the DFS, um, you know, uh, um, as per government sources, instances of non-compliance of regulatory norms as far as portfolio is concerned uh, have been found and hence uh, PSBs have been asked to look at the systems and processes with respect to these gold loans. Essentially, banks have been asked to fix anomalies with respect to gold loan disbursements of collateral, collection of fees and interest, closure of gold loan accounts, repayment in cash. So all of these are you know, uh, quote-unquote regulatory gaps that have been found uh, uh, by the government. And, uh, you know, the banking secretary is already on record uh, saying that uh, a comprehensive review has indeed been ordered. Uh, you know, as in how we have more details on this, we'll come back. But uh, this is basically a very clear directive uh, to the government-owned banks to basically pull up their bootstraps as far as uh, the gold loan portfolios are concerned and clean it up and, you know, come back with uh, what the progress on that front is, basically. As of now, this is what it is. All right, uh, Sapna, thanks very much uh, for that. More on the story as we uh, go along, but uh, we'll try and get you some reactions as well from uh, banks themselves. We'll take a quick commercial break here. We'll connect with Deepan Mehta, director at Elixir Equities, for some fundamental stock taking. That's coming up in just a bit.
Welcome back. Hope you're having a good morning. For starters, though, the gift if you're suggesting some bit of a pullback, a 30-point pullback is what we could see yesterday. Remember, we went all the way down to around 21,900, and from there, we saw a bit of a bounce at close. Let's see how things go. But let's discuss some stocks. We have Dipan Mehta, Director of Alexa Equities, who joins us on the show. Hi, Dipan. Good morning. Hope you're feeling good. And I'm wondering whether or not you have your shopping list ready, because the markets have been looking a little bit jittery. May not be the headline index, but from the broader markets. If yes, from the broader markets, any couple of stocks that you could share with us that you're looking to buy? Yeah, good morning, Nigel, and thank you for having me on your show. This is not even a correction, Nigel. It's just a minor blip, I think, uh, considering the kind of uh, move up we have seen. So there's no shopping list as of now. Uh, it can start only when there's a deeper correction. I was just seeing that template which you put out, the Nifty is hardly down by, what, 1.5% from its peak. You know, a correction is when it's dropped 10% minimum from its peak and we're a long way from there. So let's not get into a buying mode at this point of time and see how this actually kind of plays out over the next uh, few weeks or so. I think next one or two uh, weeks are very important. And if, the, if this correction deepens, then you will have maybe some more uh, selling pressure and more momentum-based selling taking place. And if you notice the list of stocks which have lost a lot of value, maybe 25, 30, 35, 40%, those are the ones which, where the fundamentals are extremely poor or you know they have got hardly any profits and valuations were really out of whack. The really good quality mid-cap stocks have not really corrected as much. And from an investment perspective, we just want to wait and watch and see how this particular correction plays out. Okay, all right. No shopping list as of now. You know, Deepan, I wasn't referring to the Nifty. Actually, I was referring to the broader markets because out there, the index has corrected more than 10%, the mid-cap and the small-cap indices. And stocks are down by 20 30%. But as you said, maybe some of some stocks ran ahead of fundamentals. For, so for the time being, you want to wait and watch. In our top 10 segment, we had covered a couple of stocks, Federal Bank and South Indian Bank. The RBI has wrapped them on the knuckles yet again. They have uh, issued a directive to stop issuing co-branded credit cards. What's your view on this and the recent regulatory action that we've seen? See, Nigel, both these companies are trading at very attractive valuations, no doubt about that. Uh, I would say about 1, 1.2 times book or so. Uh, but their growth rates also are slower than some of the larger private sector banks. With Federal Bank especially, there's a little uncertainty around uh, the next uh, CEO, uh, considering that there's no extension given to the present one who had really turned around the company per se. Uh, and as such, you know, uh, given that our view is slightly cautious, we just want to wait and watch on all these companies where there is some kind of regulatory action or some uncertainty around how they will scale their business forward. So I would say that if you're an investor, I think just remain invested. But from a fresh investment perspective, uh, it's better to keep the powder dry and look for good quality uh, franchises which may be available at even lower valuations over the next one or two weeks if this correction deepens. Mm. Uh, Dipan, hi. Good morning. So, you know, I mean... It, the important point to remember here is after such a big rally, there is two days of a fall that we've seen, right? So having said that, I mean, this is barely a correction, as you said. Uh, but, but for a long-term investor who is maybe looking to create a shopping basket, in the mid and the small cap space, if you had to identify a couple of names for us where you feel that the fundamentals are still strong, valuations are not that expensive, and maybe it's a good idea to be buying, maybe not now, a week from now, which ones would they be? Yeah, good question, Sonia. You're trying to get names out of me, but I'm there every week on your show. So next week, you know, we can talk about <laughs> names that I can think of. Because all depends upon what the correction takes place. And, you know, generally, I think the investment themes don't change because of a, of a correction of even 10 12%, 15%. And the investment themes we know are all around India consumption and around capital goods. So if we have some correction on those good quality stocks over there, the likes of Trend, Titan... And, uh, you know, maybe Indian hotels, uh, Interglobe Aviation, you know, healthcare, travel, tourism, retail. I think if, uh, these, if, the, if the leaders over there correct by 15, 20, 25 percent or so and are in a good zone, uh, then I think that's, that's the starting point for a shopping basket. Same holds true for capital goods companies, the likes of the last and Tobro, ITD Cementation, which are all sitting on huge order book position. Indian defense, PSU defense companies also, where there's good earning visibility, uh, real estate companies as well, which are, you know, sitting on very good projects and NAVs keeping on increasing quarter after quarter. So as such, I think, you know, fundamentals are pretty decent for a whole host of industries, as I also heard on your show earlier. 
It's just that the valuations were getting uncomfortable and I can't give a reason or a trigger for valuations to correct, but they, they should correct in order for them, for you to start looking at making fresh investments at least. Mm. That's an interesting and important point, Deepan Morning, uh, that you made, right? And uh, <clears throat> day before yesterday, I was saying the same thing, which is that falls have happened. Indexes, uh, small cap indexes corrected 13%, but things that you want to buy uh, are not down that much. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I was giving this example day before. If you're a flexi cap fund manager, would you be, uh, and you're sitting cash on your hands, would you be jumping with joy because things have fallen a lot? Probably not, right? Because things which have fallen, you would not have bought on the way up in any case, and they are now starting to come off. Uh, so, so it, in that sense, makes uh, not very much difference. Uh, of course, I mean, there are exceptions uh, here and there, and it's all, of course, subjective, and beauty, as they say, lies in the eyes of the beholder. Uh, but point taken. Uh, Deepan, so far, corrections have been short-lived and very brief, 4%, 5%, that's it. And the market turns right back. Do you think this time it could perhaps be a little different and uh, maybe a little more prolonged? What's your sense? See, I think uh, a lot depends upon the uh, technicals of the market and the capital flows. And, you know, till now also, yesterday also, we saw very strong uh, DII flows. If there was some threat over there, then I would say that this could be a deeper correction time-wise as well as price-wise. So I think more than watching the FII flows, the next few trading sessions, I'll be watching the DII flows. Because there is some tinkering happening over there as far as flows coming into small mid-cap funds. And certainly, uh, you know, let us really observe the sentiment of the retail investor, uh, whether, you know, that it's staying steadfast or whether there is some kind of a flagging over there. Uh, these are the important points to look out for. I think fundamentally we can't figure out any particular trigger uh, which may take stock prices significantly lower. And stocks have moved up also on account of huge liquidity flows into the market. So I think the key barometer to watch over here is the liquidity coming in and going out from the market. And whether that is different from some of the other minor corrections of say few uh, four or five trading sessions, which we have seen over the past maybe 18 months or so. All right. You know, Deepan, yesterday, in fact, we had Nilesh Shah of Kotak who joined us and the point he made was that in the next 12 months, the domestic mutual fund industry, they could have close to around 4 lakh crore at their disposal going by the current run rate of SIPs, going by the maintained close to around 100,000 crores of, uh, you know, liquidity with them. And also there's some balance advance funds as well. So put all of that together. So domestic mutual funds, they will pick and choose what they want to get into. But Deepan, I wanted to ask you your view on Coal India. But first, let me just tell our viewers about a note that Jefferies put out on Coal India earlier today. They say that they have a buy rating, target price of around 520. They believe that this 13% decline that we're seeing in the stock, it's a good buying opportunity. And two big reasons they've given out there. Volume growth, they're expecting it to continue to feed India's rising power demand. And they're working with 8% growth for this year and closer on 6% CAGR growth for the next couple of years. On Coal India's targets, they're saying for FY24, what they've set out to do around 770, they're pretty much on board. On their FY25 basis, what Coal India has said, well, they are a little bit lower than that 838 million tons. The second point that they're mentioning besides volumes is that there's a big fall in e-auction prices, but they believe it's largely behind. And if you pull up the trajectory, the e-auction premium to FSA prices, that's come down you know, from around 200% to 117%. And for this quarter, it's in that vicinity of around 35 to 50%. Jefferies is working with a 50% premium, and they are saying this is more or less in line with the average that we've seen in the last 10 years or so, which is around 63%. But if it does fall, then that's a risk to their EPS estimates. And the third point they make is, first point is volume, second point is on e-auction prices, third point is on valuations. They're saying it's trading at around 8.3 8 times, which is at a bit of a discount in comparison to its historical averages, and a discount in comparison to the Nifty as uh, well, Nifty multiples. And, uh, you know, so that's all the reasons that they've given why they're positive on it. Uh, Dipan, do you buy this argument? Coal India at around 417 rupees. It was a 480 rupees stock a short while back. But also, if you go back to maybe 12 months or so ago, it was less than a 250 rupees stock. Your view? Yeah, certainly, I think all PSU stocks, including Coal India, have done well. And there's no denying the fact that overall efficiencies at the company certainly have improved. But at the end of the day, it's a cyclical business. And, you know, in times like this, if you expect the correction to deepen, and I still expect that sometime in 2024, maybe mm. the 200 day moving average will get tested. So I'd like to be in cash as of now and then look for opportunities to buy into great businesses which you otherwise can't buy in a bull market where you can, where you can see scope for multi-bagger returns. I won't identify those companies as yet, 
but intuitively i feel that it's better to buy quality businesses when there's a correction and not stocks like whole india okay i want your thoughts on uh, some of these companies like uh, tata motors as well because there's lots happening there right i mean they're making a huge investment to set up an ev manufacturing unit so definitely they're optimistic there but i'll do one thing i'll take a short commercial break we'll come back with more on the other side of the break mitesh thakkar and sudarshan sukhani will join in for some technical trade stay tuned All right, 13 minutes to go for the pre-open session, and uh, you know we'll see how the start this morning is. But uh, yesterday, of course, was a complete, uh, uh, you know, a waterfall kind of a decline in the broader market, especially. But Mitesh and Sudarshan are with us with uh, how are things looking, uh, gentlemen. Good morning. Good to have both of you here. Thanks very much, Mitesh. Uh, start with you, and start with the <coughs> Nifty, which also corrected a bit uh, yesterday. Now some are pointing to this uh, ending diagonal pattern. Which has been in place since January, as and and, and uh, saying, well, this perhaps indicates that maybe the market is finishing something. Do you buy that? Have you looked at that? Uh, and and uh, your thoughts to begin with, and then we'll get into other uh, stocks and indices as well. Go on. Morning, Prashant. So one, I'm not an expert on any yet. So ending diagonal is something which I don't use regularly. But uh, you know, we have been of the opinion that uh, we will possibly yesterday only morning uh, session. I said. Will possibly test and this time break twenty two two fifty head towards twenty one nine fifty then twenty one eight hundred and in the worst case scenario twenty one three fifty. I think that view is on the uh, stand. I think you know very clearly uh, we have had a lot of indicators averages on the intraday charts and then short term charts recording negative crossovers. Indicators are cooling off from extremely overbought situations. Typically, should be a deeper pullback than what we have seen. For the last many weeks, so I think yes, there is uh, some kind of confirmation of a short-term top being made around twenty-two five hundred one, and two, this pullback could be slightly deeper than what we have seen in the last uh, few weeks, few months. So, uh, as I said, I think twenty-one eight hundred eight fifty zones is somewhere you know there is important daily moving averages coming in, but the way the structure is panning out, eventually I think there is a chance of us breaking below that and heading towards twenty-one three fifty. So uh, maintaining a, uh, uh, the view that you know this is a market which is changes short term nature from buy on declines to sell on rallies and therefore I think you know we uh, will be looking at more of shorting opportunities in stocks as well as in, uh, as in indices. Okay, all right, Mitesh and congratulations. Yesterday I recall during the day as well I asked you uh, you know what about will you look to buy and you said no buying right now. We are maintaining our short stance and you know that perfectly worked out because yesterday we ended virtually at the low point of the day. Good morning, Sudarshan. Let's get you as well into this discussion. Uh, what's your view on the index, the Nifty at around this 22,000 odd mark? Good morning. Well, our uh, stop loss, or let's say the exit point was 22,200. Yesterday, that uh, number came in during intraday trading. That was lucky. There was no gap. So, my trades, all long trades and traders should have closed their trade at 22,200. Once the Nifty breaks this level, as it did, then we are in some kind of a correction. Now, in a bull market, it's very difficult to define corrections, whether it will be 10%, 5%, or at least this one or any one. So we just say that we are in a correction. How does the correction end? Usually, the correction ends when the market stops falling and starts building a base. That's a process that is a little choppy, but that's the first sign that this decline is coming to an end. So we'll have to wait. There is no buying. Uh, I'm very uncomfortable going short in an uptrending in a strong, roaring bull market. So the trade for me is to do nothing till the Nifty stops falling and starts moving sideways, creating that base that I talked about. But the bank Nifty is surprisingly different. It still maintains a bullish stance. 
Okay, I think that is the best piece of advice I've heard in the last 48 hours. Do nothing because that's also a trade, right? I mean, just have patience, do nothing, ride this wave and let it pass. Every day doesn't have to be a day to trade. Got it. But uh, Sudarshan, on individual names, if someone wants to take some positions today, uh, A, do you advise that? And B, what are the stocks that you're looking at? I think it's, uh, you know, Sonia, this is a dip and a correction. And good quality stocks, at least for positional traders, uh, should be available and they should be looking to buy. Now, my trades are also for swing traders, but ideally, these dips are meant for people who want to hold for a few weeks. Supply is a buying opportunity. The stock actually has maintained its levels, not participating in the decline. Buy with a stop under 14.45. ICICI Bank is a buy. As I explained to you, that the banks are doing their own thing. And surprisingly, they are diverging from the Nifty. So the ICICI Bank is a buy with a stop under 1,065. Naveen Florin is an intraday short. It is already in a bear market. Sell with a stop above 29.60. And finally, Infi. If you see the chart, Infi did not participate in the decline yesterday. So Infi is a buy with a stop under 15.90. All right. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Mitesh, uh, what about your trades? Uh, I have more of sell side calls, you know, believing that this decline will continue. Though after a big decline yesterday, there's always a chance of a pullback. But I think we'll maintain a negative bias. Uh, LIC Housing Finance is a sell with a stop at 603 for a target of 565. MM Finance is a sell as well. Uh, keep a stop just about 272 half. Look for a target close to about 250. And Escorts is the third sell call with a stop at 2775. Look for declines to about levels around 2600. One buy call, which I would not want to buy immediately, but I say through the medium and the long term structure is very good. So if you get, get it slightly lower from yesterday's close, it's around 565. Buy then or accumulate around that 565, 562 mark with a stop below 552 for a first target of 590. Okay. Uh, let's do one thing. Let's thank our guests for joining us. We have Chandan Taparia who's also joining in. He's the derivative technical analyst at Motilal Oswal Financial Services. Chandan, hi. Good morning. Um, how are you feeling about the market now? Because this has been a big sell-off. Uh, any thoughts on how to approach it here on? And what are the individual stocks to look at? Good morning, Sonia, Prasant and Nigel. Thanks for having me. So we have seen some profit booking in broader market. Uh, however, Nifty corrected by only 500, 600 points. But major selling was there in mid in small cap because most of them really do well comparatively. So first, if I talk about the Nifty index, uh, we witnessed profit booking decline from its lifetime high of uh, 20 to 525 kind of levels and drifted lower to 21,900. I believe as of now, an immediate support comes at 21,830, which is 50% retracement of the entire recent move. And that also 50 day exponential moving average. So I believe that decline could be there till 21,830. That level could provide some sort of stability to the index, but yes, a small cap and mid cap are witnessing profit booking. So we need to uh, be cautious there. We need to wait for a couple of more days to get some bargain hunting in the selective names. Uh, so now talking about the key levels till it doesn't surpass 22 to 22 zone, I believe sell on bounce could be there. Intraday bounce will be there, but that, be, that will be kept for the indexes of now. Now talking about the Bank Nifty index, uh, Bank Nifty has been making lower highs, lower lows, but comparatively it has not fallen. And the good part is in last couple of days, we have seen open interest addition of around 80, 85%. And those loans are still intake. And because of that, I believe that if reversal has to come, then that will be there from the Bank Nifty Index. And we have multiple supported 46,666 to 46,500 marks. Now talking about stock specific, first trade is buy on ICSA Bank. Uh, this stock is holding well, even after the market decline, it is holding to key support zone. We have seen some put writing activity. And it is resilient at the time of market volatility, which clearly indicates about the strength or positive nature of the counter. So recommending to buy on ICC Bank for an upside move to us 1120, one can buy with support of 1065. Second trading idea that is buy on Dr. Ready. Few pharma names are likely to do well, whether we talk about the CIPLA or the Dr. Ready. It is holding the support base. Our rising trend line is there. Our loans uh, were added and those are intact. So recommending to buy on a small decline with support of 6200 and expecting Dr. Ready to head towards 6550 zone. Uh, on sell idea, last idea is sell on UPL. Structure is clearly negative. We are witnessing fresh breakdown. Cold writing, built up of short position, clearly indicate decline towards 435. So one can sell UPL on a small bounce with a stop loss of 464 marks. 
Okay. All right, uh, Chadar, we'll leave it there and have you back uh, a little later for more. But uh, we'll take a quick commercial break here. We'll be back. The pre-opening rates will be with us. We'll also have Subhadeep Mitra of Novama Institutional Equities and we put the focus on the power sector. Demand still remains pretty strong. That conversation in just a bit. Welcome back. Well, we have the pre-opening rates that are just about uh, going to be kicking in right now. So be ready for uh, the market and the kind of volatility that we've seen in the last couple of days. Uh, remember yesterday, FI sold almost 15,600 crores if you adjust for the ITC block. So there was large selling from FII's. But anyway, individual stocks will also be looked at today. Nigel, you're watching out for NMDC? Yes, you know, Kotak has come out with the note on NMDC and they are as pricing in, uh, you know, earnings that were lower than what the street was working with. So they have retained their sell rating. They've trimmed their target price to around 195 from around 205 earlier. They've also trimmed their EBITDA estimates for the next couple of years by 6 to around 10%. They are factoring in lower INO prices from year on. Keep in mind, global INO prices itself are down close to 25% in the last one month. It's at around roughly around $106 per ton, which is an 18-month low. Why did global INO prices fall, first of all? One is because the bleak outlook in terms of Chinese steel demand. The second factor is there has been some rising inventory at Chinese ports. And the third factor is lack of uh, cost support. So all these factors have played out and they have weighed on uh, INO prices globally. Why is Kota cautious though? Two reasons. One is on pricing, then it's on volume. So let's take the pricing point first. They have hiked prices by close to 36% in the past eight months or so. Remember, eight months or so ago, prices had bottomed out and from there, they've only moved up. Now they're saying that NMDC's fine prices are at a 35% premium in comparison to export parity. So they're factoring in price cuts. And that could start from April 2024 itself. So that's on the pricing aspect. The second factor is on the volumes front. They're saying that, yes, NMBC has seen a big volume growth of around 22% in the first 11 months or so. But they are saying that the best of the volume growth is now behind them. So they're factoring in a moderate 3.8% CAGR growth in terms of volumes, which is similar to what they've done in the past decade. So not too optimistic on NBC, And that's why Kotak is fairly cautious. Uh, Deepan, what do you make of, uh, uh, of NMDC? You know, in our past uh, few interactions, I've asked you, what about Ferris? You've said, Nigel, better options to look at. And, you know, that was in the uptrend. Now, in the downtrend, what are you thinking about NMDC? It has a dividend element. Problem is, I know pricing itself is collapsing. Nigel, you're fairly familiar with my views on commodity <laughs> stocks. And if this uh, correction turns out to be even deeper and you see maybe 10% type of a correction on the Nifty over the next few weeks or months or so, then you will have very interesting stocks, good quality businesses, secular growth companies, could be in pharma, could be in mid-cap IT, could be in consumption, you know, which you cannot normally buy when the markets are raging. That's why you need to focus on, and not the likes of NMDC or Coal India or some of the other quality business, or the other not so great businesses, which do not have a great track record as well, and which have high cyclicality and volatility in earnings. So that's why thinking at this point of time, I'm just watching the market for a few sessions. Is it correcting? Is this going deeper? And then keeping a track of all the good quality consumption oriented or CAPEX business or pharmaceutical businesses, mid-cap IT, you know, likes of persistent systems, which I missed out, KPIT, you know, these are businesses which are evergreen and next four or five years looks fantastic for them. But they're still trading at 50 times plus. Are they coming at 35, 40 times or so, you know, over the next quarter or so? 
that's where my mind is thinking and that's where I'm looking for opportunities. A lot of new listings also have taken place and uh, you know they had fabulous listings and huge rallies. Are they correcting over there? That's the kind of uh, you know thoughts which are going through my mind just now. Okay, all right, Dipan, uh, thanks a lot for joining us. It has been a couple of tough days for the market, but hopefully, as they say, this too shall pass. We've seen this in so many cycles, right, of the market, uh, that nothing rises in a linear fashion. And of course, now there's some pullback that this market is seeing. But let's focus on the power sector. Power demand in India has surged 6% in February and 8% this year so far. Nuwama believes this summer, expect prices to rise for two to three months. So, Badeep Mitra, the Executive Director uh, Power and, and the Power Analyst at Novama Institutional Equities is with us. Uh, so, Badeep, good morning and thanks for joining in. So, there was a 6% rise that we've seen in power demand in the month of February. But do you see that, uh, you know, do you see the sector build on to the gains in terms of more demand? What are the stocks in your coverage, <coughs> in your coverage universe where you think there could be more? Hi, good morning and uh, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, so yes, I think if you if you look at the fundamentals of the power sector, you know, on an average last twenty year average, you've seen the power demand growth range between four uh, percent to seven percent. Four percent in let's say a very bad year, seven percent in a very good year. I think even if you look at power ministry or CEA estimates of power demand growth, we are looking at the numbers being factored somewhere between six six and a half percent or. Uh, so clearly, looking at power demand growth sustaining in that six six and a half percent range. Uh, typically, seasonally, you always see a spike in terms of uh, peak demand going into the summers and later as the monsoon recedes uh, towards, let's say, August and September. Uh, so those are the two seasonal spikes that are anyway awaited. Uh, but yeah, based on that, I mean, our sense is that the fundamentals of the power sector haven't changed. We are looking at uh, reasonably strong growth continuing. And the relative uh, short supply situation continuing for maybe the next two to three years until the renewables and the thermal capacity pickup, which is currently in the ordering phase, catches up. Mm. So in yeah. this scenario, uh, sorry, in this scenario, our take is that, you know, much of the utility stocks were already uh, overheated. We actually had, uh, you know, more downgrades and upgrades, you know, barring an NTPC in the utility space, uh, not really seeing much upside in any of the other names. Uh, primarily because most of the future growth seems to be already factored in. And for many names, let's say classic example like a power grid, although we are seeing uh, a much higher capex buildup over the next two to three years, the earnings CAGR will, is, is back-ended, right? Because most of these projects are expected to commission, let's say, only three to four years down the line. And hence the CAGR is impacted. We actually prefer more names on the capital goods or the industrial names, which are the equipment suppliers or the EPC manufacturers. Uh, who are coming into this space. So let's say names like BHL on the thermal side where we anticipate the 8 to 10 gigawatt of annual ordering to continue. BHL has won almost like 100% market share in the current year and we anticipate at least a 70 to 80% market share going ahead. Uh, similarly, yeah. EPC names like uh, Kalpataru Power where we've seen uh, you know uptick in terms of order inflow on the domestic TND side uh, as well as Middle Eastern orders flowing in, I think there is a, a re-rating in terms of PE that can happen for the stock since most of the uh, issues of the past are behind us and we are seeing uptake uh, both in order inflows as well as strong margins. We also have recently initiated on a relatively smaller name transformers and rectifies drill, which is a high voltage transformer player. Uh, now, what we understand from the industry is there is a shortage of high voltage suppliers in the market you only have five to six key suppliers in the market uh three mncs and three indian names of which uh tril is one uh, and clearly seeing a, a lot of traction in terms of the high voltage capex that's coming in because of the renewable connectivity you know because of which we're saying okay power grid capex might go up two and a half to three times their current rate uh so i think the near-term beneficiaries will probably be more of the equipment and these epc suppliers Whereas for most of the utilities, I think, uh, you know, the future growth and the green transition, much of it is probably already there in the price. Barring NTPC, so we see some triggers panning out. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, sorry. For paucity of time, I just want to squeeze in one more question. Uh, you've downgraded Tata Power and IEX. Is it only the uh, rally, the valuation discomfort that is worrying you or anything else? So clearly, uh, so both, are, let's say, uh, 
in a sense different animals so in case of tata power while we like the business we clearly see uh, traction from the renewable transition coming in uh, however having said that i think the transition will take 2 to 3 years in the near term are we really seeing any large earning triggers probably not you might see plateauing out of earnings probably for the next 1 or 2 years before the renewable uh, piece actually kicks in and you start seeing the profit growth coming in and again uh, you know at the current prices i we believe that you know most of that growth is already factored in and purely from a valuation perspective uh, we felt that you know uh, tata power price was getting overheated which is the reason we have a reduce on that name uh, okay we'll do we x it's it's sure, slightly different yeah sorry for i x it's slightly different it's more about the structural game now changing towards a scenario where power prices are anticipated to remain on the higher side and typically when you have higher prices you tend to see volumes uh declining at least on the exchanges as volume moves towards more longer term contracts and then then on top of that you have you know the regulatory uh issues in terms of market coupling etc which has been talked about in detail you are seeing some pilot projects on market coupling coming in so as and when that progresses over the next let's say 1 2 years uh you will probably see the market leader in the exchanges seeing uh you know hits on volume Okay we'll let you go on that no thanks a lot for joining in and giving us your thoughts uh, that's the word on the power sector but let's also take a quick look at what's happening in the market in pre opening it's uh, kind of quiet um, you know maybe that little bit of that ominous uh, feeling coming through that perhaps things could get worse from here the mid cap index actually is down about 300 odd points so let's take it straight to the technical guess uh, sudarshan what's the big call at 910 and given what you're seeing in pre opening do you get a sense that today could be an on call after what we saw yesterday or not quite is it too early to call that well uh, i'm not quite because yesterday we had a very wide range day usually choppy days follow after such a wide range uh, infosys is a buy with a stop under 1590 all right mitesh what about you what's your 910 call I'll go with a sell on LIC housing with a stop at six zero three for targets of five sixty five. Okay, all right. Uh, <clears throat> let's talk about the uh, standout brokerage reports now. Nimesh is here with that. Nimesh, money. Uh, money, Prashant. So today's standouts on IPCA Labs. HSBC has today upgraded the stock to buy from hold, and they've raised the target price to thirteen thirty five. Of course, there is a roll forward as well. But HSBC believes that IPCA can see a notable uh, improvement in margin expansions. on the back of healthy growth in focus markets which is india and uk as well as easing cost pressures now they are building in an ebitda improvement of 470 basis points and a pad cagr of 50% between fy24 and fy26 estimates so that's a big number that they are talking about and they believe that the start uh, of the us supplies could be a, a fresh catalyst for the stock going forward however some risk as well that they are highlighting one the continued volume slowdown in the india market and two adverse development in the exports market which potentially means uh, currency uh, de depreciations or supply chain disruption so while they see some risk but the risk reward is favorable according to hsbc on ipca labs and hence an upgrade to a buy now with a target price of 1335 okay all right uh, thanks a lot for that namesh we'll keep an eye out on that one but abhishek is back with us to tell us about a stock that he's featuring in our momentumizer segment abhishek please go ahead Uh, well, Nigel, I says a bank is on focus uh, with respect to momentum as a stock. Uh, this is with the fact that they, uh, the stock has outperformed Nifty and Bank Nifty over the last one week as well as last one month. So on a weekly basis, I says a bank is down 1.4 percent when compared to a decline of uh, 2.1 percent in Nifty and more than 2 percent in Bank Nifty. In terms of monthly momentum, I says a bank is up 6.4 percent, which compares with a 1.2 percent gain that you are seeing on Nifty and Bank Nifty gain of about 3.25. percent uh, yesterday's volume of about close to 2695 crore this was the highest volume uh, that you are seeing in uh, icici bank over the last 3 to 4 weeks and in terms of delivery volume it was close to 53% the stock is right now trading at 1084 per share which is above the 20 dma and just 2.7% away from its 52 week high back to you all right uh, abhishek thanks for that uh hormuz is standing by with what jeffries has to say about made in small caps hormuz morning morning prashant and jeffries is a good news and bad news as well now starting off with the bad news first oh, actually it was good news first he say jeffries is mentioning in its note that the correction that we are seeing in the broad markets right now is just another correction and not a proper meltdown as many on the uh, as uh, the adjectives go when they are saying that more correction though is possible in the broader markets given the volume surge and flows into the small and mid cap schemes but they say that the strengthening capex cycle makes a lot of these small and mid cap stocks attractive for the long term 
Now, it has highlighted certain periods where broader markets have seen a sharp surge and that sharp surge is followed by an equally sharp fall. Now, in this period now, as of date, the mid-cap index is down close to 7% from its peak while the small-cap index is down 12%, but that is preceding a 65% fall uh, gain in the mid-cap index and almost an 80% surge in the small caps. Now, why is it calling this uh, not a repeat of the 2018 correction that we saw in the broader markets? Is because it's around the similar lines uh, in 2018 as well, where we saw fund flows being restricted due to the surge that we had seen. And But in 2018, the correction was extended because of the NBFC crisis and the introduction of the capital gains tax. However, this time around, uh, the macroeconomic fundamentals of the country remain strong, and hence, this is not a repeat of what happened in 2018. What Jeffries is also saying is that uh, fund flows are starting to moderate, but while the small cap fund flows are still 7 percentage point above its 5-year average, the mid cap index, the flows into the mid cap funds are back to its 5-year average. Although volumes, volume activity remains very elevated, but despite this correction, Jeffries is betting on property developers, industrial and power companies and select PSUs. Back to you. Okay, I like the way how Hormuz, uh, you know, was trying to bring the good rather than the bad in front of us. Thanks a lot. I think some mood enhancers always a good thing, especially at a time like this. I also want to look at the uh, electric vehicle related stocks, the EV component suppliers. So there is uh, Sona, BLW, there's Uno Minda. Uh, Nomura has put out a note where they've said that EV component suppliers like Sona and Uno Minda will be key beneficiaries of the government's continued focus on electrification. There's a new scheme that was launched by the Ministry of Heavy Industries. It's called Electric Mobility Promotion Scheme. Now, this is to support electric two-wheelers, three-wheelers and e-rickshaws. Um, this is, of course, the CNBC TV18 news break, so that has been confirmed. Uh, the only thing is the incentives for electric two-wheelers has been reduced to 10,000 rupees from 22,500 earlier. But a couple of my analyst friends tell me that this was something that was expected, the incentives to go down. Mm. The fact is that the government continues to push electrification, which is positive. Absolutely. Right on cue, Sonia, the market opening on your screens. Uh, and I think we've got, what, uh, 21,943 coming up on the Nifty. Uh, those are the first rates and the Sensex is coming up in, with some rate as well, but 180 odd points, 187 points. So uh, 72 points lower on the Nifty and 185 points lower on the Sensex are the first rates. Straight away to mid caps and small caps. Mid cap index is down about 1%, 573, five, 600 points lower on the mid cap index and the small cap, which of course has been the bigger pain point. Uh, and that index was down 5 yesterday. The small cap index uh, is down about 1% as well. So uh, a weaker start. Uh, we'll see, but these are the first rates. But more with Sonia. She's standing by. Sonia. Well, thanks a lot for that. I think the important number is right there, right? The BSC uh, declining number, which is 1,124 stocks on the declining side and just 420 on the advancing side. So that goes to show you that the market breadth is very, very weak at the moment and at least at the start of trade. Let's see how it goes from here. I also want to uh, once again pull up the small cap index and the mid cap index. There you have the mid cap index down almost 500 points over there, down over 1%. And the nifty small cap index here is down 1.5%. So not looking good as far as the opening for the market is concerned, which is the broader markets. Straight to individual stocks then, Tara Motors has signed an MOU with the Tamil Nadu government for setting up vehicle manufacturing facility in the state, so that is positive. I also want to see what's happening with HDFC Bank because there is this FTSE rebalancing on the 15th, which could lead to more flows coming into HDFC Bank. And this is important, while the market is down quite a bit, the HDFC Bank stock is down only 0.3%. So clearly, there is a degree of outperformance that we're seeing. Also, delivery buying has picked up in HDFC Bank in the last couple of days, so keep an eye out on that. Coal India, Nigel was talking about that a while back, so it would be interesting to see it. Look at that, outperforming the market. Jefferies has a buy call with a target price of 530 on Coal India, so it's looking pretty good over there. Uh, Chola Mandalam Finance, Jefferies has a buy call on that stock as well. They have a target price of 1400 on the stock, which is a big upside to the current market price, so there's an outperformance there. Uh, Chola Finance is the one I'm talking about. IFL Finance, on the other hand, more downgrades coming through after what happened in the recent past. HSBC has downgraded it to a reduce with a target cut to 340 from 790. But, uh, you know, uh, it's already at 385, so there is perhaps some more to go on the downside. A couple of more stock action in terms of news flow. Godrich Properties has bought a three-acre land in Hyderabad. The booking value potential is 1,300 crores. Uh, JSW Energy has bagged um, a letter of intent from Solar Energy Corporation for 700 megawatts connected solar capacity. Kalpatru Power Projects has bagged an order worth 2,445 crores. HAL has bagged an order worth 8,000 crores for 34 advanced light helicopters.
first and I want to look at the EV stocks once again. You have Sona, BLW, you have Uno Minda. The, they, these would be the key beneficiaries of the government's continued focus on electrification as per a Nomura report. But otherwise for the market, I think the Nifty Bank is feeling the heat now down almost about 380 odd points. While the Nifty is holding steady, it's the broader markets which continue to be under pressure. Back to you. All right, Sonia, thanks a lot uh, for that. By the way, uh, you know, Nimesh's standout brokerage report on IPCA, that one is flying away. That's up closer on 5%. So clearly the street taking note of that one. Hindustan Copper as well as up closer on 3.5%. It's corrected from around 300 rupees to around 235 rupees yesterday. But copper prices were up overnight, as Manisha told us. So that's why that stock, in fact, is up closer around 3.5%. Managar Gas has seen a sharp correction in the last few days, but that's opened up in the green. It's up closer around 3% from around 1,500 rupees, went down all the way to around 1,200 rupees. But that one is higher in today's trading session. What else is moving uh, around? Well, uh, you know, I just want to point out two, two key aspects for the Nifty to hold up. One is Reliance Industries. That, at least for starters, it's come out in support of the bulls. The 50 DMA, as I mentioned earlier, that's the one I'm tracking. 2,845 is the mark you should be looking at on the downside. For the time being, it's well above that mark. The Nifty Bank is the other one. That as well, the 50 DMA is extremely crucial and it's almost at the 50 DMA. So you'd want to keep an eye out on that one. If you pull up a chart, you know, you'll see that the Nifty Bank, well, it's uh, around uh, those levels. So that's another important one. Coal India, biggest gain on the Nifty, reacting to the Jeffries report. On the flip side, the fairest stocks are a little bit nervous. Tara Steel, JSW Steel, both of them down two to around two and a half percent. In the broader markets, well, they're getting pummeled yet again. Let's see whether or not in today we do see some kind of bike. Sure. All right. Uh, well, let's just look at the broader market then, right? Uh, so IPL, that is uh, the petrochemical, uh, sort of chemicals company, that's down eight. It's coming up with the largest volume-led lo uh, lo uh, loser today. So uh, 232 on uh, that one. And uh, you know, it's not as if it's been a big outperformer or anything of that sort either. I mean, it's done well. Uh, but uh, nothing compared to what some of the others have done. Suzlon is down 5%, large cut there. Uh, stocks had, uh, in large volumes as well, but a 5% cut. Inox Wind is down 5%. So both Suzlon and Inox are down 5 each. Uh, so that's the wind uh, power uh, companies. Tata Investment Corp is down another 5%. This one, of course, a huge, still uh, sitting on humongous gains. St uh, SW Solar is down another 5%, just under 500, 489 or so on SW Solar. Walkhard is down 5%. Uh, These are all daily limit down, right? Uh, I think. We, uh, Schneider is down 5%. So, so many names. Uh, but, you know, again, KPI Green is down 5 Web uh, Webel Solar is down about 5%. Spark is down 5%. Gensol is down 5 Gensol, of course, I think the high was about 1,400 or so, recent high. Uh, and uh, from those levels, it's basically almost half now. 788 on uh, Gensol. Uh, so, yeah, that's uh, the list of what's coming up with some uh, losses. Market breadth is negative, but it's not, it's not uh, nothing like yesterday. But this is al also just the start. Uh, so, we'll see how things pan out. On the upside, apart from what we've already mentioned, uh, Railtel is up 4%. It's the biggest number one volume led gainer. Hindusan Copper is up 4 And we, Nigel and Manisha were talking about uh, the copper price rally that we saw. Uh, Adani Energy Solutions is up 4%. The Adani Group stocks all sold off, right, yesterday. Adani, I can spot Adani uh, Energy Solutions and Adani Total, which is which are up about 3.5%. MGL is up 3 Action Construction is up 6 So there is some signs of life on the upside as well in the broader space, which are uh, coming through. Even in the frontliners, right, the interesting yeah. part is that uh, the market is finding some... Uh, you know, solace in individual stocks. So yeah. look at all the large caps. There's LNT, there's Infosys, there is of course Coal India because of that brokerage report. There's Reliance. Mm. So there's definitely buying action that's coming yeah. in. I understand that. I mean, a lot of investors speak about how they were patient for one year and their gains have been eroded in one day. Yeah. So that pain is there. That pain is separate. So, but right now in the market, you are seeing some signs of buying interest in large caps. Well, I think in the next couple of days, you know, you could see. Uh, some kind of a bounce back as well for the markets. You know, as you were mentioning, Sonia, earlier today, the advanced tax, that'll be out of the way, which is a bit of a, a, a hindrance. But And also, that's a March phenomena, you know, tax harvesting as well as adv advanced tax. So that'll slowly get out of the way. Then we'll have to look at pockets where there is a lot of froth. They'll continue to remain under pressure. But select stocks will do well. And for the time being, you know, the breadth of the market actually has improved. We have more than 1,000 stocks that are advancing right now. And if we can end with 1,000 stocks advancing, I'll tell you what, the bulls will party today. Because yesterday, there were only 100 stocks that advanced on the Nifty itself. When you had one of those 100 stocks in your portfolio, you would be very happy. 
Well, uh, you know, we'll see. But yeah, it's uh, turning, yeah. right? One, almost one is to one Getting in terms of the advanced decline yeah. ratio. That's what's uh, coming through. Harsha Upadhyay is with us, President and C Chief Investment Officer at Kodak Mahindra Asset Management Company. Harsha, good to have you with us here. You guys have been ad advocating caution for some time now. Uh, so, and I, I guess yesterday would have been one of those days where you could have picked up the phone and said, well, I, we told you so. Uh, but uh, the, the question now is, as and you and your team would be scanning uh, for opportunities because you guys are sitting on cash as well. Uh, have, with this 13, 14% fall in the small cap index, have stocks that you want to buy fallen? You know, 25, uh, 25 30, because there's this list of stocks uh, going around where uh, stocks have fallen, uh, you know, 25, 30, 35%. Uh, the, the question though is, are those the names that you want to buy? I mean, uh, uh, quality names or you think these were frothier names which went up, which are giving back gains, but you, I mean, uh, and, and, and not really the list of names or the kind of names that you'd want to be in. Uh, just give us a sense, Harsha. Uh, good morning, Prashant. Uh, clearly, uh, we are still not deploying all the money that we have uh, at our disposal. Not that we create active cash in our uh, portfolios. Uh, however, we do have some limited cash uh, in, in our small cap strategy, for example. But at this point of time, uh, probably uh, wherever we are seeing excesses is the pocket that is correcting more than uh, the overall market. So to that extent, uh, some of the names that we like on a fundamental basis are yet to reach those levels where we could probably deploy all of this cash. Uh, anyways, uh, we never uh, do that at one go. We, we generally take uh, a little bit of time in terms of analyzing the markets and uh, valuations and conditions, everything. So over the next few days, uh, we'll keep watching and we'll we'll take a call on that. But as of now, we don't think that uh, it's corrected enough for us to uh, really go ahead and deploy. You, uh, Harsha, net buyers yesterday, unfair question, X blocks, etc. Was was uh, Kodak Mutual Fund a net buyer yesterday? Uh, I don't remember the exact numbers, but uh, I mean, every day we'll be buying something, we'll be selling something, but I don't think... Uh, we bought only because of the correction that uh, we have seen yesterday. Uh, that would be my answer. Okay, by the way, guys, look at the green on the screen, right? The mid-cap index is flying now. It's up almost 7 tenths of a percent. It's up 330 odd points. And it could be very volatile. There's no two ways about that. It's not that the worst is over. But it's just that for now, the mid-cap index is seeing plenty of buying action. And a lot of names, right, in the broader markets. I mean, whether it's something like a JSW Infra, Electra, Green Tech. You have, uh, if you just sort by larger markets so, or non-index large caps, you'll see there's a lot of buying. Adani Group stocks are seeing buying interest as well. Reddington is up about 4%. Uh, so, um, well, some bit of green on the screen. Uh, Harsha, hi, good morning. You know, retail sentiment has been hit very hard, right, in the last couple of days. I mean, portfolios have been smashed out of shape. What is your advice to that retail investor who has waited patiently for one year, built on to his gains, and now is seeing all of those gains get eroded in the matter of a week? Uh, what's your advice to them, given that you've seen so many such cycles? Uh, Sonia, I don't think India growth story is uh, impacted at this point of time. Uh, economic growth continues to be very strong. Corporate fundamentals continue to be strong. The only issue with the market was the high valuations. And especially in the names where uh, there was uh, not sufficient liquidity or where uh, the fundamentals were not really supportive, uh, one should uh, continue to remain careful even after this correction, I would say. But if your portfolio is well diversified and if it is based on the fundamental strength of those uh, businesses, then uh, these uh, uh, corrections are also part of the overall uh, market movements and you will be able to uh, wade through this volatility. But just make sure that your portfolio is diversified and you are making uh, a staggered and disciplined investments rather than uh, putting in all eggs in one basket. Indeed. Uh, hi, Arsha. Good morning. Uh, you know, before I ask you my next question, I just wanted to uh, pull up a few stocks that have Bounced up by close to 10% from the day's low. I'll just request my director to pull some of these stocks up. IRFC, you pull up the intraday chart out there. The stock was down close to 5%. Big bounce from the lows. SJVN, well, that one as well is up close to 11% from the low point of the day. So the intraday charts come up for you. Hoodco is the other one that got slammed yesterday. That stock as well is coming up. And these stocks are coming up on very, very large volumes as well as IRCON. So some of these stocks are bouncing back. We'll have to see how long can they sustain. And the Nifty Bank, by the way, if we could get that 50 DMA with the Nifty Bank up for you, it visited the 50 DMA, and from there, the Nifty Bank has seen a bit of a bounce. And I think that's going to be a crucial trigger for today's uh, trading session because it's taken support out there. 
and it's moved up as well. And Reliance Industries is batting for the bulls. That's what I'm talking about. The 50 DMA, it touched it. And now, in fact, it's moved a little bit above those levels. So, hi, Asha. Good morning and good to see you in as always. Uh, Asha, you know, we have some news in terms of the auto stocks today with regard uh, to that EV push. There's a bit of an extension. So some part of that subsidy has been cut down. What's your view on the auto space on the whole? And if you have a view on this EV theme, because it generated a lot of excitement in the uptrend. And now, in fact, you know, maybe in the next four months or so, we don't know whether that'll get extended. And the subsidy as well is getting pulled back. So some of that excitement could be fizzling out. Your take. Uh, Nigel, on the EV part, I think the, still the jury is out uh, in terms of what's going to happen. Uh, not just the subsidy cut, but also there is a question mark whether uh, EV technology is going to be superior or hydrogen technology, which is more viable, or the hybrid uh, you know, in between. So to that extent, I think uh, only over the next few years, we'll have a clear answer in terms of uh, how this space is going to shape up. But clearly, I think IC engines are going to make way for something a newer technology, that's for sure. But it's going to be a gradual uh, change over the next few years. Uh, as far as auto companies are concerned, uh, uh, especially two-wheelers and the passenger vehicle uh, manufacturers have been seeing reasonably strong demand, and that has continued into 2024 as well. So within autos, uh, these are the two sub-segments where we have been positive on. Uh, tractors uh, have been weak, and even commercial vehicles of late have uh, turned weak. So those are the two pockets uh, where uh, we would uh, probably be a little more cautious. Uh, going ahead as well until we see signs of uh, recovery in demand. Uh, you know, you mentioned that there is no problem with the India growth story. It is only valuations that were concerning the street and now some of that froth is coming off, right? Fair enough. But going forward, do you think that this could be a period of protracted pain for the market? That once the price correction stops, we could also get into a prolonged period of time correction. And that could be a bit frustrating for investors. Is that a base case scenario for you? Uh, Sonia, yeah, at this point of time, it's very difficult to predict uh, how soon the correction is going to end or how uh, uh, how soon market is going to start an uptrend. But clearly, uh, the momentum is broken. The market breadth, as we have been seeing over the last couple of uh, trading sessions, has turned really weak. And that shows that uh, there is clearly uh, nervousness across the market. Uh, whenever you see such kind of a phenomenon, uh, especially at the market tops, uh, it doesn't uh, uh, come back immediately. So to that extent, I think first we'll have to see some stabilization in terms of the market levels and then probably uh, some consolidation and then uh, our next move. So to that extent, uh, uh, probably it's fair to say that we are unlikely to really pull back into newer highs uh, immediately. But uh, uh, what's the time frame? It's really difficult to say. Hmm. You know, by the way, market breadth is now almost two is to one yeah. uh, advanced decline ratio. Uh, and... Uh, <clears throat> You know, as a, as a signal, I mean, just to use, you don't buy the indices on small caps and large caps, uh, small caps and mid caps, right? You buy individual stocks. But uh, as an indication, we put out in the morning, the small cap daily simple, daily RSI was about 24. Now, that's very, very oversold. So maybe a bit of a bounce, et cetera, is possible. But, I mean, uh, it's all about stocks and what you own and what you don't own. Uh, Nigel was talking about IRFC and just if there is any signaling effect, right, uh, to take away from that, <laughs> Uh, the top gainers are Railtel and, uh, you know, Electra and Swan Energy and uh, some of these names, right? Who got these are the pummeled top... yesterday. Mm -hmm. Who got pummeled yesterday. So, uh, Rico Auto, another one. Now, <clears throat> we'll see, but uh, this is uh, this is still very, very early days uh, in terms of what the opening uh, looks like. Uh, and I think we'll see more changes. This is the first chapter of what will play out uh, today. Harsha, uh, in terms of... Uh, themes and sort of opportunities, etc. Uh, what are you guys really looking at? I mean, let's just talk about hospitals for a bit, right? Quality uh, healthcare is a real need and uh, hospitals have made so much investment. Everyone is expanding. Uh, have you, but there was some, some news slow recently, which uh, took stocks down even before this mid cap, small cap fall, 10-15%. Uh, I think there is still, they're still there, uh, available a little lower. Uh, have you looked at that space closely, uh, taken a call, uh, act, uh, sort of acted uh, in any which way? Uh, Prashant, uh, not in the uh, recent times, but we do have a couple of positions in our uh, portfolios and uh, we continue to remain positive on the overall uh, theme from a medium to long term perspective. Yes, uh, in the recent times, we have heard uh, some uh, issues in terms of capping up uh, prices and, and how that's going to impact profitability or even the uh, capacity expansion going forward, etc. 
So, uh, yes, in the very short term, probably uh, this will remain as an overhang until we see uh, a clear trend in terms of what's likely to happen on the regulation, uh, regulatory front. Uh, however, it's very clear uh, that uh, healthcare needs in the country are increasing and uh, there are only a uh, few listed entities uh, who are really uh, in, a, in a position to really expand the uh, hospital network. So to that extent, it's going to remain a, a clear uh, theme uh, from a longer term perspective. But yes, uh, there will be uh, intermittent uh, uh, hiccups and corrections along the way. What about city gas companies, Harsha? Mm -hmm. Again, another spot where uh, some regulatory noise took prices sharply lower. Any thoughts? Uh, Prashant, I couldn't hear you completely. Can you please? Uh, city, gas, city gas companies, city gas distribution companies, IGL, MGL. Yes, again, this space has seen uh, uh, some of those news uh, recurring every now and then. And to that extent, I think on, on the same news, uh, we have seen stocks falling many a times in the recent times. So overall, this looks uh, more or less uh, at, the, at the bottom, given the high return ratios and how uh, our volume growth is likely to continue on a secular way for this uh, particular uh, set of companies. Uh, uh, we are positive on the uh, on this space uh, overall in, in many of our portfolios. Mm, okay. Uh, well, for now, you know, the market is, uh, the mid-cap index is rising, but it's also getting very volatile. In the last 10-15 minutes, it has been all over the place. Uh, in the broader markets, you'd also want to look at some of these real estate stocks because, you know, they've, the rally has been pretty fast and swift and now there is a sell-off that's coming through as well. So, Prestige Estates, we have a couple of others. Phoenix Mills in that, you know, ancillary space is also down. Uh, some of the hotel stocks, Chalet Hotels is down about 3%. Brigade Enterprise is down 2.5%. Uh, DB Realty is down about 2%. So, in the list of volume-led losers, I'm noticing a lot of real estate companies. Harsha, what do you do here in real estate? Because, you know, the, the going has been good. The demand has picked up. But stocks have also rallied a lot. At some point, do you look to buy the dip or do you stay away entirely? Uh, so, yeah, clearly this is again one of the themes uh, which will probably be uh, very strong over the next few years. So, uh, we, uh, uh, we have not seen any excesses in terms of inventory coming into the market. In fact, it's been the other way around where uh, demand continues to be very, very strong. Hardly any inventory left in the system. And most of the established players have uh, cleaned up uh, their books and uh, have also started to grow in a reasonable manner. So overall, looks an interesting space, but again, uh, like many other spaces, uh, this has also moved up quite substantially over the last few quarters. So to that extent, uh, we would probably wait for the valuations to correct a little more. All right, Harsha, final question before we let you go then. You know, cement, there was this big theme that we're getting to an election. There's going to be a push for construction. Uh, real estate as it is as a segment was doing quite well. But suddenly, you know, there's been some fizzling off of that optimism. Volumes are fairly okay. I've done quite a few checks out there. The problem is on pricing, and they're not able to push through those price increases. And with some input costs cooling off, they're not being given that reason as well. How do you view the cement stocks from here on? Uh, on cement, we continue to remain positive. Uh, while there has not been price hikes, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the raw material prices or the uh, input costs have gone down. So to that extent, profitability is likely to uh, look better, even with uh, flattish prices, I would say. And demand continues to be very strong. And, and uh, the projections for uh, uh, near-term demand are also very, very strong. So we continue to like this thing, even at this level. Okay, all right. Uh, <clears throat> Harsha, we'll uh, leave it there. Uh, good speaking with you and uh, appreciate you joining in uh, with you. that uh, perspective. Thanks indeed. That's uh, Harsha Upadhyay with the perspective on markets. Uh, of course, I mean, uh, you know, Kotak Mutual Fund has been uh, sort of warning some caution for the last a few months uh, that uh, broader markets perhaps were getting a little overdone. Uh, so the pullback has uh, come through. Markets, by the way, is blinking red and green now. There was a sharp recovery from the day's low, uh, and now we've got in, gone into flat terrain. So 21, 000, just under 22,000, basically, unchanged from yesterday, 330. But broader market, two is to one, is the market breadth uh, which has uh, come through. Well, let's just uh, play out some uh, market opinion that we got. This is veteran banker Uday Kotak, who essentially commented on markets and whether we are in some sort of uh, frothy zone, risky territory, etc. This was, of course, uh, he's speaking at the SEBI uh, the NISM research conference. He did acknowledge that maybe there was some froth in certain areas, but things were not under control. Listen in. That I believe at this stage, we are nowhere near that risk. And there are enough checks and balances in our system today to s compare ourselves in serious bubble territory. May there may be early froth, as if I can use 
the phrase from what you said a few days ago, but I would say that it is still froth, uh, little bubbly, but not out of control. Okay, that's the word coming in from Uday Kotak. But one person who has been talking about the possibility of, uh, you know, a market fall is Prashant Khemka of White Oak. Uh, he's someone who in the past as well has spoken of a little bit of caution in the system. Listen into what he had to say after the recent fall that we've seen. If you look at over the last 12 to 24 months or even I would say uh, somewhat longer post-COVID, it's been a... Uh, somewhat of a one-way street and equity markets. Uh, so there was this uh, some overconfidence setting in um, amongst investors, particularly as it relates to small cap names. Small caps, despite the 10-11% downtick that we've seen over uh, the last few weeks since the um, high that was reached earlier this year, it's still up 60 plus percent from March of last year. At its peak, it was up 80 or nearly about 80%. So there was a, a considerable amount of excess that uh, has been built into certain segments of small caps. And so it's a timely, I think, uh, I would say even an awaited correction. Of Kotak, Mahindra AMC added that this correction in the market is an unwinding of excesses. Take a look. So one thing I can reassure everyone, the stress tests are not going to give any cause for this correction. If we see last one year, it was one two ka thin market. The large caps delivered about 33% return. Mid and small cap delivered about 61 and 69% return. And small cap delivered, micro caps delivered about 93% return. So this is the unwinding of the excesses rather than, you know, the stress test of mutual fund. It is stress test of leveraged retail investors. Okay, it's a stress test of investors, not so much uh, the companies and SMEs. But uh, anyway, for the market, it's still very quiet. Uh, it's flat, the Sensex and the Nifty. The mid-cap index is the one that's seeing a recovery. So that's a good thing. After yesterday's carnage, there is no uh, incremental pressure, which is, I think, a great thing from a market standpoint. But let's see uh, how the rest of the day goes. For now, we are focused on Adani stocks. They have been under pressure. One stock we are focusing on now is Adani Vilmar, which is down 7% this week so far. Their nine months FY24 volumes were at 8%, while the total inventory stood at 7,000 crores. To discuss how is the demand situation, how is business momentum, we have Angshu Malik, the MD and CEO of Adani Vilmar, who's joining us now. Uh, Angshu, thanks a lot for joining in. Uh, you know, in uh, as I mentioned, uh, sir, in the nine months of this year, in FY24, the volume growth was about 8%, so it's still in single digits. Uh, and in Q3, the volume was flat. Has demand come off uh, quite a bit? Are you, you know, worried that perhaps there could be a bit more of a slowdown before things pick up? Uh, what is your best guess of how the next uh, couple of months could look like? And what is the volume growth that you're targeting for FY25? See, um, the first uh, two quarters uh, were not so good. But uh, the last quarter, this quarter, we are seeing good growth in terms of volume. Uh, we expect uh, for the first time the branded edible oil business will have a double digit growth possibly after four five years the country is seeing higher uh, consumption of edible oil as a result uh, the overall uh, business of edible oil has improved in terms of volume prices are low so the consumptions are higher uh, q4 should be also equally good in terms of volume growth going forward the country is likely to consume more edible oil because in the stable prices, uh, we see uh, this uh, consumption overall continuing at this. At least FY25 might be a little better than FY24. Okay, so you said double-digit growth is what you're looking at for FY25, correct? Uh, yes, in edible oil for us. In in edible oil, okay. And can you tell me about the pricing situation? How is it right now? What is the expectation uh, going forward? See, the prices has been quite stable all through uh, the last uh, four, five months. So only it's last 15, 20 days that the prices have gone up. And that is because of the supply side uh, constraints, uh, particularly shipments not arriving on time. But these are all uh, logistic issues, which I think uh, 
by 15th of April, it should calm down. So uh, looking forward, uh, the supply chain should be normal as usual. And country has also uh, produced good mustard oil, mustard crop. And so that will add from next week or so after Holi. So the supply chain will be very good. All right. Hi, Mr. Malik. Good morning. Nigel on this side. And you're sounding quite optimistic on business. So that's always a good thing to hear. Well, uh, you know, what about your market share? How do you see it panning out from your own? Uh, this year, the market share has increased by almost uh, 75 to 100 basis point. Uh, that is mainly because of our in-depth distribution, both in urban and rural. Uh, okay. We have uh, increased our number of uh, dealers in the rural market. And uh, today, uh, surely our direct reach is more than 700,000 retail outlets. Indirect, indirect is around 2.1 million. So we are the largest distributed edible oil in the country, branded. Yes. So I think, uh, I think uh, going forward, we should continue to do better. All right. So we've increased market share by 75 to 100 basis points, which is good news. You want to give us an updated number, though? We have some numbers flashing on the screen, which is the overall and the we branded should, business. We should close at, we should close at uh, refined oil consumer pack. We should close around 19% uh, okay. or maybe 19.1 by March. Next year, okay. we are targeting a little higher. Uh, and uh, we hope to do that. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, so branded market share, sir, you're saying is around 90, 90 and 90.5%, right? 19% at least, 18.9% we were there last month, so I think March end should be better. And your overall mm. market share would be how much? Because, uh, you know, the numbers that we have is 12 and 20%. So I asked. 20% uh, 20, 20 when you look at is roughly around the refined oil consumer price that we look at. Uh, but mm. uh, when it comes to mustard oil, we are the largest player in mustard oil, which is around 14 and 14.8%. Mm. Uh, so okay. that makes us the largest branded edible oil player. Okay, largest branded edible oil player, got it. I also want to talk about the food and FMCG business. Over there, in, your, in nine months of this year, you've seen a growth of 19%, so that's not bad. But tell me, how is the demand situation there and what uh, is the growth target that you're looking at for FY25? See, the domestic uh, growth has been, uh, I would say, very good. We have been clocking at around 25-30%. What uh, mm -hmm. has not done well is the export of rice, particularly white rice and broken rice, which we did last year very well. So that has brought down the overall growth to 19%. Otherwise, domestic, if you see, uh, rice is growing at around 45 to 50%. Uh, wheat flour, we are growing at around 30, 35%. Pulses also, we are growing at more than 25%. So the domestic consumption is quite robust, both urban and rural. And I would say here that our rural business is also doing well in uh, terms of uh, food and FMCG, uh, mm -hmm. because these are essential products and required at every household. So in-depth distribution in smaller towns have helped us uh, gain that market share also. So would you want to grow this business further in terms of our overall percentage of your business? Currently, the food and FMCG business is just 10%. Over the next three mm -hmm. to four years, how much do you want to take that up to? See, um, you are right. Uh, we are pushing our food business. Uh, we are investing in food business. And there are a lot of capex that is coming up, both from the IPO side and from outside IPO also. And we feel uh, the food and FMCG business should grow. Uh, today, it's almost 10% of the volume, but going forward, it should be in the range of 15 to 18%. We will do around 900,000 tons uh, this year, but next year we are planning to cross at least 1.2 million tons. So um, food business should grow fast. Uh, there is a lot of scope uh, because the branded uh, food, uh, particularly the staples, when you look at sugar, spice, uh, mm. sugar, and then pulses and wheat flour, rice, their branded uh, ratio is smaller. So there is a lot of opportunity to grow and ramp it up. Okay, all right. Uh, Mr. Malik, uh, what about margins? How do they pan out from here on? Give us a broad range that we should work with. See, the margins have improved uh, with stable prices. The brand has yes. started doing that. There is a lot of premium valuation that is happening. So earlier, our mass brands were selling more. Now, the Fortune brand is selling more. And uh, okay. there we have uh, more margins. And uh, going forward, I think the margin will improve, number one. Two, as the volume increases, cost per ton reduces in distribution. Yes. And that is yes. where we will have advantage. Uh, crossing cost goes down. Uh, buying uh, mm -hmm. 
you know, ability to buy at a lower price or at a discount price increases when the volume goes up. So overall, okay. overall, it looks like uh, as the volume goes up in food and FMCG, and particularly when it is staples, it gives yeah. you uh, quite a strong power to buy at a little better prices. Okay, so from 3.9% of the past quarter, which has gradually improved, uh, given the operating leverage, given the better mix that you're talking about, what should we work with? Around 4 to 5% or more for the coming year? Mm, can't say exactly how it is, but I can tell you one thing that things are much better. It is improving. And whatever okay. uh, was passed, uh, surely we will be doing better. And okay. that Margins. is an indication. Margins are also going to improve. Uh, with uh, less volatility, the brands perform better. Okay. So mm, we feel that the margins will improve going forward. So the direction you have given us that margins will improve. Final question from my end before we let you go. Adani and Bilmar, both of them hold roughly around 44.5 to around 44% stake you know, in, in the company. So you need to comply mm -hmm. with that minimum public shareholding. How do you bring that right. down? Will you all be looking at a QIP? Which partner is going to be um, paring down their stake? If you could give us um, a broad timeline and a brief idea. See, uh, we have diluted so far 12% and we need to do another 13%. And we have to do that by February. Mm. So obviously, we are working on it. We are looking at all the options. And uh, we'll see how we can dilute the balance 13 percent and uh, make the best out of it. Mm. OK, all right. Uh, we'll leave it there, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, it's a pleasure having you here on CNBC TV 18. Good luck. Uh, speak with you soon again. We'll take a quick commercial break here. We'll come back. We'll get you an exclusive conversation with, with one of uh, Bank of America's top investment banking uh, heads. Raj Balakrishnan is uh, going to be joining us on the other side. Lots to talk about in just a bit from now. Welcome back. Uh, the market, I mean, on the Nifty is still blinking red and green. Nothing at all, but advanced decline has moved aggressively into the green. So almost threes to one uh, in favor of advances. So welcome relief as compared to what we've had over the last few trading sessions now. Uh, let's talk about the other big story, right, which is uh, uh, sort of strategic investors, PEs, long-term investors are selling in many companies here. We've seen that uh, sort of trend for the last one, one and a half years or so. Actually, since January of 2023, promoters, PEs, large shareholders have sold some $21 billion and have raised, uh, you know, $100 plus billion through debt issuances. Let's uh, talk about this in some more detail. We're now joined by, uh, we have Raj Balakrishnan, Managing Director and a Co-Head, Investment Banking at Bank of America. Uh, Raj, great to have you with us here. <clears throat> Good morning. Thanks very much for your time. You know, I want to, of course, uh, first of all, say congratulations. Uh, you guys were one of the two uh, sort of uh, bankers in the uh, ITC uh, sort of uh, deal which happened. Uh, and uh, it was a long-standing overhang. Uh, some of it is gone. But can we say it is gone uh, with regards to ITC? Because uh, BAT still owns about 25%. Uh, so what could be the roadmap ahead? I mean, if you can share, uh, you know, because you would have been in touch with both, uh, both sides. Uh, what's the thought process, really? Should one watch out for buyback announcements? Well, that has uh, you know, and, and, and bad to saying that they intend to hold yeah. their twenty-five point five percent stake for the foreseeable future. So, uh, I don't think I can say anything more than that. Okay, all right, no, uh, fair enough. As, but okay, let's just talk about the reason then, right? Uh, it's not just I, uh, ITC. We've had uh, sort of uh, announcements come through from. Uh, Tim Ken, we had uh, Whirlpool earlier. Uh, could you talk to us about what is the underlying uh, uh, motivation for many of these stake sales? 
we actually had the Whirlpool Global CEO come out and say in so many words that uh, it just is a valuation arbitrage. You know, sell stock in, uh, here in India and buy the uh, sort of parent company stock, which is available much cheaper. Do you think that is a primary driver? Uh, see, uh, India businesses uh, of many multinationals uh, are growing very, very rapidly. Uh, and uh, as a result, I think the Indian market, uh, uh, rightly in my view, uh, rewards uh, these companies with extremely high multiples. Now, uh, uh, very often, uh, this underlying value of the Indian business is not reflected fully in the value of the parent stock. And so from that perspective, for, uh, you know, as a corporate finance practitioner, it makes immense sense for some of these multinationals to evaluate uh, uh, monetizing part of the stake in the India business uh, and uh, using that for, uh, as a tool for funding their operations uh, or opportunities in other parts of the world, whether it's buybacks or uh, other investments that they wish to make. So from that perspective, I think it makes immense sense and reflects the coming of age of the Indian market. Uh, and I think uh, people are willing to take a call that, uh, you know, as long as, for example, if you're between 51 and 75 uh, percent, right. it does not really make a difference in terms of control. You're a listed company, you have a majority. Or if you're between 25 and 50 percent, once again, does not make a difference in terms of control. Uh, so from that perspective, uh, you know, taking some chips off the table does seem to make sense. Mm. Raj, is there any signaling effect uh, from some of these actions for local investors or there is none? That, you know, uh, sort of large owners uh, are... Uh, I think it's just reflective of the difference in the growth opportunities between the Indian market and what you're seeing elsewhere in the world. Uh, the mm. fact is that uh, I think everyone is very positive about India. Uh, about the trajectory of the Indian economy, the fact that, uh, and I think uh, our markets very clearly reflect that in terms of the multiples, which price in probably sustained uh, uh, high teens to maybe even 20s growth over the next uh, decade or two. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, when uh, the same is not reflected in the parent stock price, it makes sense for people to take some money off the table. Okay. Um, Rajai, good morning. I have many questions for you. But first, just to finish the loop on this one, right? Uh, does this also mean, because it was, it was a large deal that took place, $2 billion, and it just speaks about the volumes in the market, the appetite, and it also speaks about the depth of the Indian market. Would you concur that the depth of the market is improving and that is perhaps a positive signal as well? Uh, no, I agree fully. And uh, I think, you know, to see uh, a $2 billion trade, uh, this is uh, the third largest ever uh, uh, block deal in the Indian market. Uh, and it got executed in the block trade window, which is, uh, mm. you know, at a less than 1% discount. Uh, so it's the largest ever deal in the block trade uh, window. Last year, we had done a uh, $400 odd million trade in the block trade window and felt very proud of that. Uh, and now yeah. we've been able to execute a trade which was five times as large. Uh, so certainly reflects the coming of age of the Indian market, as I said. Absolutely. Uh, just, sorry, just one more follow-up. Since you've been tracking this, you know, you've been in this M&A ecosystem for so many years. What we're noticing now in spaces like pharmaceuticals is that there are a few MNCs that are looking to exit India. Um, how do you read the kind of M&A trends, particularly in the pharmaceutical space? Uh, well, uh, I don't know if people are looking to exit India. Uh, I think once again, I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, just about any company at every point in time takes uh, appropriate decisions in terms of what is the focus area. So you could have a company, for example, which decides that their focus area is, uh, if you're talking about the pharma sector for a multinational, they might decide that the focus area that they have is on patented medicines. Uh, uh, and very often those are, uh, in the case of Indian subsidiaries and 100% owned Indian subsidiaries. Uh, and they might decide, uh, uh, you know, some of the older uh, uh, a generic brand that uh, exist in the Indian listed entities uh, are no longer a focus area. So uh, people might evaluate uh, the possibility uh, of trying to see what's the kind of valuation they would get uh, should they wish to exit that. But I don't see a, a generic trend that multinationals are looking to exit India. I think what people are trying to do is optimize their portfolios uh, from a strategic perspective. 
All right. Uh, hi, Raj. Good morning and good to hear your thoughts. Nigel on this side. Well, I want to ask you about the consolidation trends. You know, we've seen in media there's been some consolidation that took place and that was long awaited. How do you see trends shaping up? Case in point being maybe the cement space. We've been hearing about consolidation. We've seen a fair bit of action and that could be more in store. Your take. Uh, no, I agree. I think in just about, uh, you know, the Indian market presents tremendous opportunities. And I think what we've also seen is, you know, the, uh, uh, let's say 10 or 15 years ago, virtually every trade you thought of was uh, an Indian selling and a multinational buying. But with the coming of age of Indian companies and the availability of capital that exists for Indian companies, now you're seeing a number of trades where you have uh, uh, Indians buying or private equity sponsors buying uh, and uh, in some cases multinational selling, in some other cases uh, uh, Indians uh, strategic selling. So I think it reflects, uh, uh, you know, the M&A market in India today is no longer unidimensional but is multidimensional with each and every company uh, taking calls uh, based on their own strategy and portfolio choices in terms of what they want to do. Mm. Uh, Raj, just a little bit of here and now. Uh, do you think with uh, a little bit of shakeout we've seen in broader markets, the pace of, sort of QIPs and IPOs perhaps will slow down a little bit? Uh, PEs and VCs, et cetera, may continue to uh, sort of monetize as we've been seeing. Would you agree with that? Uh, no, I would disagree with that. I actually think that, uh, for example, last year, you know, we saw a large number of uh, IPOs, but uh, they were relatively small IPOs. So the total amount of funds raised through IPOs was relatively low. We had only four trades last year of more than $300 million. Uh, uh, on the other hand, I think this year uh, is going to see many more uh, larger IPOs. Uh, and uh, I would expect uh, the total funds raised uh, through IPOs this year to be significantly more than last year. Similarly, in terms of QIPs, uh, last year was a great year for QIPs, uh, as well as for block trades, uh, and I think I continue to see that trend continuing this year. Mm. Mm. A lot of it, obviously, is also market underlying market conditions, right? So, in a way, uh, Raj, you're also sort of saying that uh, we should we should move past this current phase of volatility and a bit of drawdown that we've seen. Yeah, I think you all focus excessively on what's happened in the last three days uh, or last week. Uh, 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 frankly speaking, if you look at the Indian market, uh, be it on a uh, three-month basis or one-year basis or five-year basis or a uh, ten-year basis, it's delivered returns superior to virtually every market in the world. E even on a dollar-adjusted basis over the last decade, uh, barring uh, uh, the U.S. market, uh, we are probably the best-performing market in the world. Uh, so the fact is that uh, the Indian economy is looking good, Indian markets are looking good, uh, and, you know, a face of uh, if there's a correction for uh, a week or two or even a couple of months, uh, I don't think that changes the underlying trend. Mm. No, I, I completely agree. Uh, but we also talk excessively about the short term because we talk every day. <laughs> so <laughs> there is that element to it. But we also, I can assure you, talk yeah. about the longer term returns. Uh, and, and we do that, uh, that point about, I mean, actually over a 20-year period, uh, I think the returns uh, absolutely stand out. Uh, compared to the rest of the globe. Just on that second po part of my question, uh, do you think this PE and VCs are selling, we've kind of reached a bit of a, uh, a high uh, and it should taper off from here? Or what's the pipeline looking? But Because you would have a bird's eye view. Uh, if you just look at, uh, you know, the sheer volume of investment over the last five years from uh, the PE and VC community in India, uh, it has been uh, 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 tremendous, right? Uh, several billion dollars of investment coming into India every year. Uh, and as you know, a number of these funds have uh, a defined life uh, and look to exit, uh, say, in a four to six year kind of time frame. So I do think you will see several examples where uh, investors uh, uh, look to uh, uh, realize the gains that they have made and return money to their uh, uh, principals or LPs. But at the same time, uh, I think you will, will see uh, newer uh, uh, PE and VC funds are looking to make fresh investments in India. So uh, this is part of the natural trend in markets. So I, don't, I would not see that as either positive or negative for India. 
The fact is that at this point in time, for uh, virtually any uh, PE fund, uh, India is a key focus area. Uh, and just because they realize uh, investments that they made four or five years ago, uh, it does not mean they're not going to make investments from the fresh funds that they have raised more recently uh, and deploy them uh, significantly in India. All right, we'll uh, let you go on that note. Thanks a lot for joining in and giving us your perspective on all the M&A activity that has happened in the market in the last uh, many weeks and months. But by the way, uh, the market is breathing a sigh of relief for sure. Uh, so today what's happened up until now is that the headline index has been steady. No real selling pressure. In fact, there's been recovery. So the dips have been bought both in the Nifty as well as in the broader markets. Just look at the mid caps. Mid caps are up 330 points. Now, we're not saying that the worst is over, but just that for now, things have sort of quietened down a bit, which is what we perhaps needed after the carnage that we saw yesterday. Mitesh Chakkar is joining in now for a quick tech check. Mitesh, how are you feeling about the market? Uh, do you think the rest of the day could also move quietly like this? And what are the stocks that you're looking at? So, uh, my sense is that the structure is weak, but with the kind of fall we had yesterday, I think, you know, a part, partial covering of the big candle is possible. That, you know, the very standard way of an intraday pullback playing out after a big declining or a red candle day. So maybe, you know, you might see uh, levels of around 20 to 100. Uh, uh, in the best case scenario, even 20 to 200. I was, would, you know, be mentally opposed to it. But I think at 20 to 100, 1 to 200, I think that zone could be tested. But the structure is weak. So we'll maintain a negative bias. Only on some stocks, you know, I had a buy on ICICI two today. I think that's turned positive. Only on some stocks where you have a uh, long-term comfort, I think, you know, uh, where the long-term charts are very good, will uh, suggest a long. So one of them is Pridilite, which I would suggest buying with a stop below 2800 for targets of 2900. And I have a sell call as well because the structure uh, to me, I think, you know, is weak. So it suggests a sell on Sriram Finance. Uh, keep a stop about 2330, uh, which is just uh, around the day's high. And look for targets below 2200. Okay, all right, Madesh, thanks a lot uh, for that. Well, the markets have seen a good bounce from the day's low, and some of the stocks are really taking off. One such stock is IPCA Laboratories. It's buzzing in trade. Nimesh had highlighted the stock in a special segment, D Street uh, you know, uh, Brokerage Reports. He's joining in to fill us in with more on that. Nimesh, I think I'm so eager to hear your <laughs> D Street chatter later today that uh, I'm getting carried away because I missed it yesterday. But tell us about IPCA Laboratories. Uh, well, on IPCA Laboratories, uh, there is an upgrade coming in from HSBC. So today they've upgraded the stock to buy with a target price of 1335 versus uh, 1125 earlier. Now, HSBC believes that uh, IPCA can see a notable uh, improvement in, in margin expansion on the back of healthy growth in focus markets, which is India and UK, as well as easing cost pressures. Now, they are building in uh, a, a, an EBITDA improvement of nearly 470 basis points and, and, a, and a PAT CAGR of 50% for, for uh, FY24 to FY26 estimates. Uh, and, they, and they believe that the start to the US supplies could be the next big trigger uh, for Ripka to do well from here. On the, on the, on the, on the risk side, uh, they, see four, they foresee a couple of risks. One, continued weakness in the, uh, in the slow run in the, in the India market. And two, uh, adverse development in the global markets, which includes uh, the currency depreciation as well as supply chain disruption. So, well, they see some risk, but the risk reward is favorable according to HSBC. And hence, a buy on, on IPCA Labs to, uh, an upgrade on IPCA Labs to buy now with a target price of 1355. Okay, Nimesh, thanks a lot for that. So, that was the standout brokerage report and big map move coming in on IPCA Labs. Let's take a quick break. On the other side, we'll put focus on the commodity space with Manisha Gupta. Do stay tuned in. Welcome back. As promised, let's get Manisha Gupta to tell us about what's happening in the commodity markets. Manisha, what are you tracking today? 
Well, Sonia, I'm looking at corporate and Dr. Copper. I want to call it that because finally we're looking at a lot of support coming for this one. You know, for all these months, equity markets were doing well, but not copper. But we are finally looking at LME copper now trading at a seven-month highs above $8,800 a ton. If you look at the New York copper prices, those are trading at a 16-month highs. And the Chinese copper prices are trading the best at almost 24-month highs. So every time zone that you look at in globally for copper prices is trading at a multi-month highs for these markets there. Well, the support really comes in quite strong on a week-on-week -week basis. If you look at copper prices, we're up by 4% and it's 8% up in the last one month as well. The copper inventories is like an interesting number to watch out for. When you look at the Chinese copper inventories, well, it has jumped up quite strongly. We started the year with 30,000 and we are looking at 230,000 tons of copper inventories right now. But on LME, it's quite a reversal really because we started the year on a weaker note, a stronger note rather, and we've seen nearly 30% of a decline come in for the copper inventories on the LME markets. So there is uh, some online warrants that markets have have seen onto this one. Now, most interestingly, and this is the point to watch out for, 15 Chinese smelters have agreed, and this is a rare one, really. They've come jointly, and they have come up, uh, they have said that uh, they will cut production due to losses there. Now, TCRC charges, when you look at that, have continued to decline as well. If you look at the overall smelting that Jan and Feb have seen, it has been 11.5% of a decline onto this one. So much of this has been inactive. Various reports have already suggested that. And processing fees for uh, copper in China and global markets has continued to decline. It's at a decade lows. I actually want to take you through those charts as well. So when you look at uh, the latest numbers that have come in in sense of TC, it's as low as 3 to $8 a ton at this point in time. On 1st of March, it was at $12.19 at, in Feb. November, that is when the prices got decided for all of this year it was decided at $80 a ton which was already lower than 2023 on what they saw at 87 so from 80 of a decision we are trading at 3 to $8 a ton in sense of TC charges and the markets are scared that it could go to zero and is the reason you have seen all of those smelters come together and talk about cutting production now this tells you that the near term tightness is something that is supporting copper and if the smelters do not work then from concentrate to copper cathode is something that you will see tightness come in for as well the other thing is Kodelco, where the production also has continued to decline. There are mine disruptions as well. So copper clearly in favor at this point in time. And experts tell us that from these levels as well, 8 to 10% of an increase in next three months is what you should be ready for. Right. Uh, <clears throat> Manisha, thanks very much uh, for that. We'll take a quick commercial break here. We put the spotlight on regulatory actions and governance on financials. We'll connect with Abhizar Devanji. Uh, who's, of course, uh, heads that practice at EY India. We also have Mr. S.S. Mundra, former Deputy Governor, uh, Reserve Bank of India. Anand Sinha, former Deputy Governor, RBI, is also going to be with us. Stay tuned, that conversation up next. Okay, welcome back. Uh, markets bounced uh, from the day's lowest point and, of course, doing quite uh, okay now. Broader markets are doing even better because that's essentially where uh, the problem and pain has been. Market breadth is looking positive. Now, regulatory action and governance and financials are in the spotlight today. Uh, a bunch of actions uh, have come through recently. And uh, to discuss all of this, we have Abhizar Divanji of EY India and two former deputy RBI uh, governors, Anand Sinha and Mr. S.S. Mundra. Gentlemen, great to have all of you here. Appreciate your time. Mr. Mundra, if you can st uh, start by uh, asking you, sir, uh, on something that we reported, this is of course source-based information, but uh, my colleague Sapna from Delhi reported that the government is asking PSU banks to review gold loans. They essentially are saying that there are instances of non-compliance of uh, regulatory norms as specified by the, uh, by, by the regulator, by the government. So just wanted your thoughts on this one, sir, to begin and kick this off. Sorry, sorry, uh, sorry. I think I have little connectivity stably and uh, sensitivity. I missed your question. I'll try to switch to you know another. Meanwhile, can you start somewhere else? Yes, I I'll just yes, try to correct yes. it. Yeah, please. Okay, please. okay, okay. We'll we'll do that while you sort of uh, come back uh, with us. Uh, so, but uh, let, let's actually uh, bring in Mr. Uh, Anand, who's uh, with us, Mr. Sinha, who's with us as well. Mr. Sinha, same question to you. If you uh, want to respond. Uh, the government looking at gold loans by PSU banks uh, pretty uh, closely now. This is, of course, sources as they as uh, sources to CNBC TV 18. Uh, companies we've spoken with, I mean, traditional old gold loan companies like Muthur in the private sector have told us that public sector uh, banks coming in the space has raised in, uh, competitive intensity in a very large way. This is the feedback which has been there for the last year and a half or so now. Uh, how would you look at this, sir, in the context of? sort of, you know, general 
uh, you know, regulatory and compliance related measures which have increased over the last one month or so. Go on, sir. See, as far as gold loans are concerned, uh, there have been some problems in the NBFC sector, gold loan companies, we are aware of that. Now, in the case of public sector banks, what exactly is the concern? Uh, I'm not aware of, but one thing I can say from a regulatory and supervisory perspective, that when any portfolio expands at a rapid pace, it's a red flag for regulators because uh, invariably a large expansion and a fast expansion is accompanied with weaknesses developing in control systems. So could be uh, that that could be a concern and uh, Exactly what is the concern now? As I said, I'm, I, I really don't know, but if the portfolio is expanding rapidly, then certainly it becomes a matter of concern. Uh, it does not mean necessarily that things are wrong, but it certainly means that one should have a look on the control systems, on the appraisal processes, on loan sanctions, and ensure that the system is uh, fit to deal with this kind of expansion. No, I mean, the pace of expansion of gold loan portfolio has been uh, very, very fast, right? But, I mean, for many of these PSU banks, uh, the base relative to their own balance sheet size was small, but now, of course, uh, it's become much bigger. You know, some of the aspects which, the, uh, which uh, we, we've been told is banks have been asking to fix anomalies uh, uh, with respect to gold loan disbursement without collateral, uh, with respect to collection of fee, interest, closure of gold loan accounts, etc., and also with respect to repayment in cash. These are some of the specific points, Mr. Sinha, which the RBI is talking about. Mr. Mundra, if I can bring you into the conversation. Uh, Mr. Sinha telling us yes, that uh, when, a, when a particular segment grows very fast, it is usually accompanied by uh, things which are left out, things which are not done properly, and the regulator uh, steps in and takes a closer look. Uh, your response, sir? Yeah. So, yeah, first, uh, of course, I'll pick up from where Mr. Sinha left. That is true. And it's simple, I am not going to a particular segment, but even if you take at the industry level, you see, if you take last three, four years, the average credit growth in the system was around 15%, whereas the growth in uh, unsecured loans was on the side of plus 30%. So I think that is one itself is a very broad indicator that certain segments need to be relooked into. Coming to a specific, whether it is gold loan or it is any uh, you know uh, other action which has taken, from whatever I see and hear so far, uh, I would let me put it like this. Uh, I don't think that it was uh, at the governance level that thing would have gone wrong or indication would have gone wrong, but it is certainly a reflection of lack of control. And I can I can speak from both the perspective, the, the practitioner's perspective and regular perspective. When I say more control, See, what happens ultimately in an organization, then there are certain units are there which are operating at the ground level, then there are targets, and always, you know, there would be a communication and pressure to meet the target. And in the process, at operational level, I think many of the controls which should have been exercised, they are allowed to be relaxed. Mm. And then things come to this level. By the time they are noticed, sometimes it is, you know, in a very initial stage and you can control them, sometimes it has become quite big. So at that point of time, even if regulator is asking them to correct them and giving a deadline, actually in practice it becomes very difficult. So you will see both the things. Regulator, you know, see in all these cases, you would have seen that regulator has been engaging with the entities for quite some time. It's not a very sudden action, uh, but despite that, things have not happened. And this is what at the grand level which contributes to this. Got it. Uh, let's get Abhizar Devanji into this conversation as well. Abhizar, a lot has happened, right, in the last fortnight. I mean, the RBI has come in and tightened the screws on several uh, sectors, whether it's gold loan <laughs> financing, whether it's loan against shares, whether it's IPO financing. Which are the other segments that you think could be vulnerable from here on? And what are the implications of all of this regulatory action? So, firstly, I think to answer your question, Sonia, which are the aspects that can still be covered? I think the larger concern is end use of loans not being known. So, gold loans or personal loans, one doesn't really know where the money actually lands up. Does it land up in consumption or aspirational consumption? Does it land up in the stock markets? Uh, you know, does it land up in repaying other loans which are otherwise being delinquent? One doesn't know. 
So I think the, the bigger issue is going to be anywhere where end use is not clearly defined is an area where a regulator will have a concern. So I think that is the primary issue. Now, if you, uh, you know, just uh, continuing with what uh, the other two executive, uh, the, the two uh, RBI deputy governors have said, you know, the, the real issue that we have on hand is the changing business model of banks. Mm -hmm. Banks have tended more towards retail and within retail towards, you know, unsecured or where the, the ultimate end use is not known. Now, banks have also tended towards that. And by the way, by tending towards that, they've entered into an NBFC category. What happens when they end into an NB NBFC category is that the NBFCs who actually borrow from banks have to slide a little lower down the credit scale. When they sli slide down a little uh, lower in the credit scale, then they have to accept cash, then they have to uh, mend the customer, when they have to make sure that they make certain concessions, and that is where control breakages happen. So mm. what is happening is that there's a, control, there's a shift in the business model that's been happening over time. Mm. And, and I think that is what is uh, the RBI or the regulator, including SEBI, are trying to grapple with hmm. one where the money is going and what kind of credit is actually entering the system okay you know, uh, do you uh, do you agree to mr mundra's point that um, the gold loan clampdown is actually not at a governance level it may be a, you know a more proactive measure that the rbi is taking i mean particularly on gold loans uh, you mentioned that end use is a concern got that i mean not knowing the end use of that uh, you know that loan is a concern uh, but what else do you think could be the primary concern here? And how do you think the way forward would be on gold loans particularly? No, I, so I agree with uh, Mr. Mundra when he says that, uh, you know, these are more control-related issues where RBI is trying to preempt uh, a potential mm -hmm. bubble. Uh, and, and yes, there is concern. Obviously, every regulator will be concerned where there is a, there is a potential bubble building up. And we're seeing that, right? The stock markets have melted down over the last two, years, two days. What will be the implication of that on loan against shares? One doesn't know. So, I'm, so I think a clampdown is more uh, a precursor, uh, a worry that the central bank is looking at. It's not necessarily fraud, uh, but it is process-related uh, issues that they are going to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the yeah. only thing is that the frequency of it is causing a little bit more, more of an alarm. With too many things happening it, uh, too quickly is, I think, what is causing the panic. In quick succession, all right. The other thing which uh, which which has happened is RBI halting fresh issue of co-branded cards at Federal Bank and South Indian Bank. Abhisar, you want to take that up? Uh, that is also that also re seems to be with regards to specific entities. Yeah, again. So again, I don't think these are specific entities. You know, everything you just look at it. They are fundamentally against co-branded cards. Hmm. Uh, what what RBI is saying is co-branded cards is what it's basically outsourcing your core business. Hmm. Somebody else is issuing a credit card. The underlying belongs to somebody else. The customer belongs to somebody else. The bank is a booking vehicle. And when those kind of issues happen, then there is always a concern that is the bank exercising enough control to make sure that their credit is worthy. Mm. Uh, and, the, and the next step that they are expecting is that there will be overdue on credit card payments. And those overdue on credit cards are already happening, by the way. Overdue on credit card payments in the co-branded section uh, hold a far bigger risk because the customer doesn't belong to the bank. And I think that is why it happens. And I don't think it's going to be specific. They've picked up two, uh, two inspections. But, you know, it, it is, again, an area of concern that people have. Now, again, you know, I think the, the larger issue is the bigger bubble that's, that's brewing up. Uh, and, you know, I was just chatting with one of these uh, younger chats, younger groups. And they were saying that, oh, we are, we are more interested in aspirational lending. now. So this whole concept of aspirational lending is actually scary. Because the aspirational income may not be there for that particular segment. Mm. But if the aspirational borrowing happens, then there is a chance that there could be, uh, you know, higher levels of delinquency. You used uh, the B word, bubble word. <laughs> <I was there. laughs> In what, what segment exactly? You said, no, no, so you said the bigger thing which is uh, brewing, yeah. So, you know, resources are like water. Hmm. Once you push it into the system, it can just go anywhere, right? It can go to the stock market, it can go to the, uh, you know, credit markets, it can go to real estate, it can go wherever. Hmm. So which bubble? Difficult to say, to say. But I think what, what is to be controlled is the resource distribution. And that is what I think the, the central bank is aiming at. I think that's well put. Maybe we can say bubbly, not, not bubbly yet, but... People are using <laughs> words like fluffy and bubbly and... You know. <laughs> 
All right, uh, we'll leave it there. You know, uh, we wanted to go on, but we're completely out of time. Abhizar, Mr. Mundra, Mr. Sinha, appreciate all of you joining us here on this uh, quick chat today. Thank you very much uh, for your time and uh, look forward to speaking with you soon again. By the way, I just want to leave with the small cap index, right? I mean, not the nifty, not the mid cap, not the bank nifty. The small cap index is up almost 2%, all right? And that's the uh, rebound that we have on our hands uh, already. Look at that. And steady kind of rise is what we've seen today. Market breadth is positive, almost 3 is to 1. 600 down, 1800 up. So clean, neat, 3 is to 1 advances to decline ratio. Uh, the bank nifty is slightly down, about a third of a percent. Otherwise, there's green on the screen. It's a wrap from all of us here. It's goodbye. Thanks for watching. Uh, Chartbusters up next.